for the whistleblower law, new, new rules and best practices. The conference is jointly organized by Transparency International Latvia, the American Chamber of Commerce in Latvia, the British Chamber of Commerce in Latvia, the Irish Latvian Chamber of Commerce, the Norwegian Chamber of Commerce in Latvia, and last but not least, the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in Latvia. And I just forgot to, to go to the microphone. Sorry for that. But I, I hope that you did hear all, you all heard, heard the beginning. And I will just take it out. Sorry, can you help me, please? Because I would like to move back there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the interruption, but what I also wanted to say that in addition to Transparency uh, International Latvia and five uh, chambers of commerce, we also thank our co-host Wilgert's law firm. The law on, on whistleblowing was adopted by the Parliament of Latvia uh, in October 2018. It will enter into force very soon, already on the 1st May of this year. In this conference, we address the implementation of the law and the ways whistleblowing can contribute both to the organizations and business environment as a whole. I would dare to say that this is a unique occasion when so many different organizations, both from non-governmental and private sector, have joined forces to create a joint event to discuss a topic which is of vital importance in creating more fair and more transparent society. Let's hope that such alliances continue to flourish in our country. Last but not least, this conference would not be possible without the support of several organizations and companies. We are extremely grateful, therefore, to the US Embassy in Latvia for their support to Transparency International in organizing this event. We are equally thankful to the Riga Business School for hosting us here at these premises. And we are also thankful to such companies as Beta and Airbotic for their support. I hope that this conference serves us all as a source of valuable information which will help to shape fair and sustainable business environment in Latvia. Therefore, I welcome all you and I wish to enjoy the event. And you know how it goes with conferences and with event management. You start planning with one idea in your mind and then everything starts to change. So the first change is already here, which means that uh, unfortunately the US amb ambassador to Latvia uh, could not attend today, but instead we have Paul Politis, Deputy Chief of Mission of the US Embassy in Latvia, who has joined us representing the ambassador. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this. It's a very important, very timely event. As you know, uh, fighting corruption is a top priority for the U.S. Embassy and for the United States government, and I know it's a top priority for many of you here. Um, and I'm especially pleased to join the American, the British. There's a lot of chambers here, so they, uh, I hope I don't leave anyone off for, for the American, British, Irish, Latvia, Norwegian, and Swedish Chambers of Commerce in Latvia, along with Transparency International and the private organizers and sponsors of this event, uh, the Vilgert's Law Office, Air Baltic, Bite, Latvia, and the Riga Business School. So as Ambassador Pettit wrote in uh, op-ed last December, uh, corruption eats away at the very core of society. I think there's an enduring and it's very unfortunate myth that corruption is somehow a victimless crime or that there, there aren't a lot of victims that, that society doesn't suffer. And in fact, the exact opposite is true. Uh, corruption undermines and eats away at faith in government. It scares away investment, costs jobs, and it makes the entire country poor. In fact, everybody in society is a victim of corruption. And major investors, both foreign and domestic, frequently complain to me and to us at the embassy about corruption and the investment climate here in Latvia. And I can assure you that we raise the issue of corruption at every opportunity and every meeting that we have with the government and members of parliament. 
Uh, we provide training to Latvia's law enforcement agencies, uh, prosecutors, judges, financial regulators, and we exchange ideas and best practices on issues ranging from cyber crimes uh, to money laundering. And today's discussion highlights one of the key steps Latvia needs to take in order to step up its fight against corruption, and that is to effectively implement the new whistleblower law. Uh, the United States, like Latvia and every other country on earth, has struggled, uh, wrestled with corruption, and especially how to protect whistleblowers. Since, and we've struggled with that since our founding in the United States 240 years ago. In fact, the first documented case of reprisals against whistleblowers came in 1777 when two naval officers filed a complaint for misconduct against their commanding officer and uh, to thank them uh, for doing the right thing, they were thrown in jail. And so as a result of that, uh, Congress passed the first Whistleblower Protection Act in 1778 and the two officers were actually released from jail. Uh, since then, the spirit and the success of whistleblower protections have been celebrated in popular culture and in the government in the United States. And they're, they're tales of citizen heroes, of people who stood up against injustice to do the right thing. And these uh, tales of real life American whistleblowers have uh, won acclaim on the big screen. Uh, for example, Al Pacino was a policeman in the New York City. Uh, well, Al Pacino was an actor who played a who played the cop Frank Serpico, who exposed a massive police fraud ring uh, while in, in the New York City Police Department, while Meryl Streep played the role of a technician in a nuclear power plant who exposed misconduct. And it doesn't get much bigger than these two actors uh, playing these roles in the movie, and these films have inspired countless other people to report illegal activities. And the lesson from these movies and from countless other whistleblower cases that is clear, is that whistleblower laws work and that whistleblowers pay, play an essential indispensable role in fighting corruption and making sure that all citizens, the weak and powerful alike, are held to account for misconduct. And so today, whistleblowers who pursue claims against corrupt government contractors in the United States can receive between 15 and 20% of the funds recovered. And that in 2017, in just the healthcare sector alone, that amounted to $250 million of compensation under the False Claims Act. And that's a powerful incentive for people in the United States to report fraud. But first things first, and before we talk about ways to improve the whistleblower law, we need to work to ensure that the current law here in Latvia is implemented effectively. And so in that spirit, I want to thank all the participants, and I applaud all of you for your interest in today's topic. And I look forward to a fruitful and engaging discussion. So thank you again. Thank you all. And now I would like to ask uh, to give floor to Claudio Rivera, who is Associate Professor and Director of Bachelor Program of Riga Business School. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly, warmly welcome you to Riga Business School for this extremely important conference. And uh, for a democracy to work, for a market economy to work, politicians, public officials, and business leaders should feel the importance of personal accountability. Once we have power, we are supposed to be account accountable for everything we say, for everything we do, and for everything we decide. If we want the rule of law to prevail, if we want a fair market economy to function, inst instruments to make leaders accountable for their deeds are crucial. That's the reason why the law we will be discussing today is so important in this country. When I got the call from the organizers requesting me and Riga Business School to support this conference, I immediately and enthusiastically said yes. And the reasons are two, actually. One is personal and one is institutional. 
The personal reason is because my homeland, Argentina, has been heavily damaged by corruption all its history. So recently, they have, Argentina has enacted the law, the, the whistleblower law, and it is actually paying back currently. We see the same in other countries like Brazil as well, in Latin America. So I, I would like to see the same here in Latvia in the near future. The second reason is institutional. Riga Business School has an, a, a very important role in creating the new generation of business leaders in this country. But how can we create a new generation of business leaders if our young students see that many current leaders benefit openly of corruption schemes and get away with that without any sanctions. So corruption certainly is a cancer. Sometimes we can think, oh, with the change of generation, it will pass away. History proves the contrary, actually. So it doesn't disappear, it just gets worse. So we need to a very proactive approach to that and I think this law is a step forward on that direction. So again, welcome, and I wish you a very productive conference today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Claudia. Before proceeding further to the first section of the conference, I wanted briefly to discuss why we actually wanted to organize this conference. The very idea of the conference was that, the, that in October we had newly adopted law, which will enter into force only in May. And you know how it is with every law and every piece of legislation. There is a normative reality and then the, there is a practical reality. And those of you who, we, who did take your whistles can you please take them somewhere closer to you because I would like to try to show this difference between the normative reality and practical reality by using those beautiful instruments. So when the Parliament of Latvia did adopt a uh, law on whistleblowing, it was like taking and holding whistle in your palm. It's a useful instrument, it's a very perspective instrument, it can bring some benefits, but if you just keep it in your palm and do nothing with it, well, it's, it just stays in your, and remains in your palm. And then there's a practical reality of every piece of legislation. It's practical implementation and enforcement. And in the context of this particular piece of legislation, the practical reality and implementation starts when you put your whistle in, in the mouth and you whistle. But before you do that, <laughs> because part of me still is not sure it's a good idea entirely, so, uh, because of course of, uh, of the no noise. So let me, let me um, try to divide you in groups. Let's remember that Latvia is, uh, Latvians are singing nation and that we have very strong traditions of choral, choral singing. So let's, I will divide you in three groups and we will, we will play a very small, very short melody with whistles, okay? You will be one group, do you agree? Is there, is, is there any, any, any enthusiasm in you? Do, yes. Thank you. Uh, the, you will be the second group, all right? If you do agree, of course. Thank you, and you will be the third group. And the melody goes like that. Uh, let's assume pam, 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 pam. Meaning two whistles, two whistles, one whistle, but there's still a second line. And so the second line is pam, 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 pam. So at the, at the end, we should have a melody like pam, 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 pam. Can we try it, please? <laughs> First group, please, two times. Perfect, great, very good. Second group. Very good, and one. Very good, and the second line goes two times. And three times. Perfect, and that was a general rehearsal, and now let's go to the very final uh, performance. Two, two, one, two, 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 three. One, two, three.
All right. What was the, all the point of this? Well, apart to, to just to have fun a bit uh, and, and, and trying to whistle uh, a whistle. The point is very serious, actually, that uh, if we do not pay enough attention to, to the way how impl regulation is uh, implemented in reality, if we just read the law and, and try to be creative in, in the compliance and not to actually uh, do activities, not to establish processes and procedures that achieve the regulatory goal, then you will you and we all, we will just be here as, as people who, are, who have the whistle, but they keep, uh, keep it in their palms. And the idea of this conference is that our hope is that when you leave, you will take away not only knowledge about the existence of such law, but also some practical guidance, practical advice, uh, best knowledge of uh, other organizations about how actually implement uh, certain requirements of this law. And with this, I do proceed to the first section of the conference, which is called the benefits and risks of whistleblowing. I'm very honored that uh, uh, such guests as Ines Akushte from the State Chancellery and Maris Wynowskis from Everstedt Sutherland Bitans have, have agreed to, to participate in our conference. And let me briefly introduce Ines and Maris. Ines is an expert in public sector reforms and good governance, and she is here because she has been instrumental in drafting the law on whistleblowing. And, that, and as I can imagine, it hasn't been an easy job, and I'm sure that Ines's long experience at the OECD has helped her immensely in this process. Another speaker, as said, is Maris Wynowskis, partner at Evershed, Sutherland and Bitans, and also Chairman of Investment Protection and Court Efficiency Workgroup of the Foreign Investor Council of Latvia. Maris participated in the meetings of the working group at the Parliament of Latvia, discussing it when it was still a draft, draft version of the law. And last but not least is Mr. Paul Sarotseps, who is moderator of the section and the chairman of the advisory board of the weekly news magazine EAR. Paus is also a former board member of Transparency International Latvia. So I will hand it over to Paus and thank you for participation once again. Thank you. Thank you, Yeba. Yes, um, as a journalist, I love whistleblowers because they not only reveal important stories, but they make them dramatic in a way that makes people pay attention to them. Sometimes stories that if they were just told as sort of normal analytical stories would not attract a lot of attention. But if you have the drama of somebody coming out and revealing a secret, then immediately pay, people pay attention and there's a greater chance that things will change, that people will pay attention to these stories. But of course, as those are my parochial, in some senses they're uh, in the interests of all of society, but they're also my parochial interests because of course journalists want people to read what they write. But another second very important principle of journalism is that you try to get both sides of the story. And I think that's the point of this panel because clearly, on the one hand, we have the law. On the other hand, we have the people who will have to implement it. And there, these two sides may not always see eye to eye about what the best way forward is in this. And that's why we have Ms. Kuste and Mr. Wynowskis, who will both, I don't think that they're exactly on opposite sides, but clearly they have different perspectives on this. And uh, we'll start with two presentations from Ms. Kuste and from Mr. Wynowskis, and afterwards we'll have a little discussion, and then we'll open the floor for questions. So, please, Ms. Kuste. Uh, hello, so my name is Ines Kuszcz and I'm working at the State Chancellery and I will very briefly explain you about the um, development of the whistleblowing law and uh, its contents. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I'm not very good with 
Um, okay, fine, good. Uh -huh. Uh, so the uh, whistleblowing law has uh, quite a long history, uh, starting with the most recent episodes of it. But I think it started much uh, longer time ago. But in 2012, it was an important um, uh, moment uh, because the first uh, real uh, uh, study came out. It was um, commissioned by uh, DALN, TI Latvia. And it was uh, elaborated by Christine Dupat. And uh, this uh, study aimed at uh, assessing the situation with the whistleblowing and whistleblowing whistleblowers protection in Latvia. And um, uh, one of the recommendations of the study was that uh, we need a special uh, legal regulation to protect whistleblowings, whistleblowers uh, because the existing uh, laws are not sufficient. In uh, 2014, um, I think uh, what happened was that Dalna went to see our then Prime Minister, Mrs. Laimdot Strauma. And uh, later on, a working group was set up uh, at the State Chancery that uh, had the task to elaborate uh, this law. But it was not very quick. <laughs> Only in uh, March 2017, the Cabinet of Ministers adopted the draft law on whistleblowers protection. That was the result of these years of work. Uh, quite intense work of the state uh, bodies, uh, the civil society, a lot of um, battles and um, fears also on the side of state administration. Uh, but um, so the law, yeah, the draft law is quite, quite weak. I must admit, but at that point we thought it's, it's an immense victory because it was finally adopted uh, after a lot of um, technical meetings and government meetings. So we sent it quickly to the parliament, but again, it took quite a long time <laughs> uh, till the next step. Uh, so first the parliament rejected this law and uh, set up a new working group <laughs> where uh, more or less the same people were involved, but uh, some newcomers like Morris and a few other people. And we elaborated the law with a different name that you all know, the whistleblowing law. In the middle, uh, we had a very interesting conference uh, where we heard the experiences of other countries uh, that are present in this room, France, Ireland, Netherlands, and the United States as well. During this year, uh, we also thought ourselves, what can we do to improve this uh, quite uh, weak provisions on protection? So we added a few, uh, few more um, guarantees of protection. And in October, the parliament adopted the whistleblowing law. So the law will enter into force on the 1st of May, uh, um, in a very brief time, actually. So uh, today uh, we are very in the middle of very intense work in the public administration uh, to um, get prepared for, for this law. And I'm very happy that today we meet with uh, you, as indeed there is also some work to be done in the, in the private sector. And probably in the spring uh, this year, there will be the EU Whistleblowers Directive. So the objectives of uh, the law uh, are three. First is very simple. Uh, it's to encourage whistleblowing. Second, uh, establish and make operational channels for whistleblowing. And the third one, to provide proper whistleblowers protection. So whenever you have some questions about the law, <laughs> as the, for sure many things are not there or not clear, just go back to the objectives. They will guide you. Uh, why did we need the whistleblowers' uh, protection? Uh, first, and uh, the most uh, important reason why we talk about protection of whistleblowers, not only in Latvia, but in, uh, in Europe uh, in general, is the freedom of expression. The um, Human Rights uh, Convention uh, and the Charter on Human Rights of the uh, European Union both uh, have provisions on freedom of expression that are basis of the case law of the European Court of Human Rights uh, on the whistleblower cases. 
So this is the, the most uh, important um, philosophical grounds for whistleblowing, but also important grounds for protecting whistleblowers as these judgments are used uh, in uh, France and in Luxembourg in the recent cases on uh, whistleblower protection. Um, yeah, the second uh, workers uh, that are at the heart of the whistleblowing mechanism uh, remain silent because uh, they fear repressions. And uh, there is a low detection and prevention of breaches. Uh, and many uh, citizens in Latvia go home and complain that uh, this uh, public body is not working or that minister or deputy is, uh, is not good, etc. But, um, um, but they do not really go and report this. Uh, 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 and so there is this also feeling of low detection and prevention of, of breaches. And this is also one of the grounds for the EU uh, directive uh, to enforce the breaches of, uh, uh, um, enforce uh, yeah, the um, um, implementation of EU law. Uh, <clears throat> uh, prevent harm to the public interest. This is very important in Latvia, but also in other European countries, which is different from uh, the United States, uh, as, uh, if I'm right, that we have this condition of public interest uh, in the reports. Uh, to increase public trust, uh, and uh, finally, also the reputation and governance of organizations, both in the public and the private sector. Uh, so the key provisions of our law, which I believe is quite simple, uh, I hope at least, <laughs> understandable, as it is mostly written for, uh, for the people, the citizens, uh, employees who will, who will report and are probably not all lawyers and one day will open this law. That was what was in our heads when we were drafting it. So it provides first time a legal definition of a whistleblower. Uh, so to en enable us to distinguish whistleblowers from other reporters. Uh, there is a section on uh, what the whistleblower report should look like and how it uh, should be submitted. There are three reporting channels. Uh, first is to report internally what we'll dis discuss today uh, in the organization. Uh, second is to report the competent authority, uh, and the third one is to make a public disclosure under certain conditions in the law. There is also another uh, aspect in the reporting channels, which is that you can report through an intermediary, uh, but ultimately the report will go to the competent authority. These intermediators, <laughs> first one is ourselves, the state chancery, it's so-called contact point for whistleblowers, and I'll talk about it later. And the second is you can report uh, uh, with the help of an association such as TI Latvia or any other uh, to help you to submit your report. So the idea of intermediation is to uh, reach the aim of the law, which is to promote whistleblowing. So these are cases when you are afraid or you don't know where to report or similar. Uh, so the law uh, establishes the prohibition of reprisal. So uh, the prohibition to cause negative uh, consequences to somebody who has blew a whistle because of, of this. Uh, the same uh, similar provision is in the labor uh, law, but it's a little bit more detailed in, in this law. Uh, the protection guarantees, uh, we have specially uh, made an article uh, which is called protection guarantees where all the guarantees available are um, uh, together uh, and some of them are more detailed in this law and others in other laws. But as a whistleblower you can easily see them all together. And finally the law establishes contact point for whistleblowers which is the state chancery. Uh, so the internal whistleblowing system, um, uh, the law provides the obligation to establish such a um, system in all public administration, uh, in all public institutions, sorry, and uh, also in the private sector organizations uh, that have 50 or more employees. Uh, so the same uh, principle will be in the EU directive, if it is adopted, of course. Um, and then there are a few requirements about this uh, internal whistleblowing system. So first one is that the organization has to uh, make a system where report uh, of violations internally can be made in a safe manner. Uh, and the protection guarantees is a second uh, requirement. 
so the protection guarantees can be divided in two. Some can be provided by an organization. Some, of course, will be only provided by the state. Uh, for example, organization can make some uh, make an eng make engagement or see what can be done to avoid that there is some reprisal against the worker who has reported um, uh, a violation. Uh, but uh, if the person has to go to the court, that will be the state who will provide the, the guarantees. And the third uh, requirement is, uh, I, I guess, quite simple, is to make easily accessible information on the system at the workplace. So that's it, actually. There is nothing else in the law. And there are many people calling us asking, but there should be something some, somewhere else, uh, some sanction uh, for not having the system or anything. No, there is nothing, uh, nothing that you could find. <laughs> That's all <laughs> what is in this article of the law. Um, so the EU whistleblowers directive um, uh, the, um, is coming up and hopefully it will be adopted um, by the European Parliament um, in the first reading uh, in April, uh, which is its intention. The directive also has um, Similarly to our law, a section on internal uh, reporting uh, mechanisms that is uh, having two articles. Uh, first is uh, the obligation to create such system uh, to whom it uh, applies, and so it's more or less the same uh, with some details, but uh, generally uh, organizations, enterprises with 50 or more employees will need to establish such system. And the second is what requirements should be respected. They are a little bit more detailed uh, than our law. So most probably our law will need to be amended in uh, two years after the directive enters into force. So um, what is in our law regarding the internal uh, reporting uh, channels is that the uh, contact point or the state chancellery has to uh, elaborate and make public good practice guidelines for establishing of internal whistleblowing system. So uh, we have prepared the first draft that we circulated. Uh, hopefully some of you have received uh, this draft that we sent to all the biggest uh, business associations. But if somebody would like to have it, please come to me and I will also send it to you. So we would like to hear your opinion about these guidelines. Uh, and uh, we'll organize a discussion on the 5th of April at the State Chancery, and then we will finalize these uh, guidelines and make them public. Uh, and also, we would like to invite, if uh, any organization has a good uh, internal whistleblowing procedure uh, that can become an example of this good practice uh, that we could include in the guidelines, please also send uh, this information to us. We'll be very happy to, to hear your, your um, experience. So uh, if you are interested in more information about what we do, uh, uh, it's not ideal, but <laughs> some information is on this um, part of our website. But uh, we are working on a new separate website on whistleblowing that is, uh, uh, will be available on the 1st of May and will be called uh, Trauxmus CLSLV. And there will be much more elaborate information on this uh, law and uh, on the possibilities to blow the whistle uh, in Latvia. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kuste. Now, Mr. Vinovskis, a slightly different view, perhaps? <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, and basically friends, of course. So it's a great honor to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yes, I think, well, you said I, I need to play some kind of a devil's advocate here or something like that. Let me just play an advocate. Um, well, um, I would like to um, bring up some uh, items for discussion with you on the topic, because now we are having the black letter of the law we're having in place, and it is a good law, right? But, you know, what we need to have in place is the rule of law, which is the implementation, and implementation through proper understanding, and through proper comprehension, and through proper protection. And I would like to uh, 
could you help me in the meantime, whilst we're doing a rehearsal, uh, put the slides. And, uh, but you know, could we start with some kind of uh, internal test? Um, we, I will not ask to raise hands because whistleblowing needs to be protected. There is no name calling, but let me uh, express you such a situation. Think about yourself. Have you at any point in time looked at something, observed something going on? You know, it could be in the business environment, it could be, uh, it could be where you interact with some certain service providers or, or, you know, think about something which is maybe not necessarily fully criminal, but still you feel it is totally wrong. So you have observed something and you have felt clearly that you need to report about it, but you have not done it. Have you been in a such a situation? Just think about it. When we ask this question uh, to put um, certain, you know, balls of, of different colors uh, in, in some seminars, you know, after the coffee break, we saw that actually half, it was basically 50% voted that they have been in such a situations. So it is very uh, personal and actually the matter of attitude, the matter of bringing the uh, items forward and the uh, basically contributing. And to whom we are contributing by properly applying whistleblower law? To, to what it is good. I also like extremely uh, active audience. So any ideas? What, uh, you know, for, for what it is? For, uh, is it good for the company? It is good for the company. So what do we else have in the company? Do we have uh, shareholders? Is it good for the shareholders? that uh, certain things are brought up at an early stage and hopefully properly dealt with? Oh, yes. So, what else? State? Is state... Uh, how state actually gets benefits from whistleblowing? Through... Uh, maybe they get some more money from proper operations, okay? So, I mean, of course, so there are, there are a, number, a number of, uh, how we can say, why the law is good and why the law needs to be properly implemented. Let's go... Um, Let's go on already on some practical topics. So, um, Inessa, you made a very uh, nice presentation on the on the initial topics, but let me let me put some controversy here, or let me let me discuss this a little bit further. So, who is whistleblower? Whistleblower, according to the black letter of the law, is a person who is in the employment relationships or enters into other kind of legal relationships which are related to employment relationships. Okay, so uh, I'm a lawyer, so these definitions are, are a little bit so, but so it's, it's something from, the, from inside, right? So that's, that's basically the idea of the whistleblowing, certain things being reported from the inside, right? So uh, we already discussed that employee is, is the, the whistleblower. But who, uh, who else? Let me put somebody, let me put some, some examples in front of you. Um, a service provider, is it a proper whistleblower? A person who provides services to the company. No employment agreement, service agreement. Yes, okay. Also, maybe not in, not, not in all instances, but definitely, you know, most could, would qualify. So, uh, who else? Uh, let's say a person has no employment agreement, no services agreement. The person is just a volunteer doing uh, good stuff for nothing. Whistleblower or no whistleblower, potentially. Yes, uh, indeed, because it's related to a job done within the company. A young student uh, comes to, uh, to the office and says, I would like to have some summer vacation, not, not summer vacation actually, some summer job, okay? So, and this guy, is he a um, potential whistleblower? Because, okay, yes, right. Let me put a little bit more controversial, a shareholder of a company, a shareholder, not an employee, not necessarily a person who is, um, entering into contract to do some job in the company. Is a shareholder a whistleblower? Oh, you say yes? 
Uh, somebody says no? Okay, yes, it, it, it depends. You know, we, we are starting to work towards a situation where a shareholder could be, because a shareholder, for instance, in a limited company, has access to full and all the company documents. And obviously, within that work and within that process, the shareholder can, uh, can come up to issues what need to be properly internally escalated and dealt with. Uh, but of course, we are we are uh, in, in 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 public in joint stock companies. Are all shareholders entitled to uh, you know specific uh, access to information? Uh, right? No, well, because you know, and it can it it needs to be. Of course, it's quite quite important legal topics here. Of course, because not. Uh, every shareholder, for especially in public companies, ca has access to every single document of the company, and uh, the company is also not actually entitled to report certain issues or, or risks to a selected groups of shareholders. And uh, there are some examples, I'm not quoting them, but you know, you see the, there are actually issues to be thought about and considered about who is the whistleblower. But um, our approach is that this, um, the, the person who is doing the whistleblowing, he needs the proper protection. And I think, you know, you remember, Ines, when we were uh, in the parliament, and especially you, there were a number of voices saying, why we do need this law? Because basically the general protections are there. It was already in our employment law saying that uh, if a person reports a certain risks or issues, it cannot be uh, victimized. So it, 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 it cannot be uh, you know, uh, laid off just because of this action. So they said everything is, is already more or less in place. But no, I think this law is extremely important for, the fo for, for those key reasons which Ines already said, but I mean it, it needs repetition. So first it is this really streamlined approach or streamlined possibility to report. So there is this obviously the center of uh, uh, the state chancellery is, is, is one of those, uh, one of the recipients, the contact point. But on the other hand, I think even for businesses, most important is to set up in the big companies and small companies this uh, point of trust for your employees so that they know who to who which person, and we will discuss it a little bit later, to whom to talk, whom to approach, who is the whistleblower contact. So that is, that is this one thinking which this law really um, implements. And the other, I think it is the protection. Putting together in one place uh, clearly those items which every person well, thinks about. Uh, so what about the disclosure? Will my name be made public? And this law says you need to actually anonymize the, the whistleblower identity. Uh, will I be laid off? Will I be called, uh, you know, in uh, this stukach, right? So will I be, will I get back some bad uh, relationships? So that is, and the law clearly says you cannot do that to a whistleblower. Furthermore, this law puts in, in a specific uh, protection not only to the whistleblower, but also to his or her family members. And plus, there is also uh, certain more clarity about access to uh, free legal assistance in case that is necessary. I mean, this is, that is, to me, these are the key items for uh, a potential whistleblower to come up, to be bold, to contribute to the society and to the, uh, to, well, first and foremost to the company where you are working, because by bringing up those issues, I think you are protecting the company first and the shareholders. Okay, so of course we need to also be aware of the risks. And sometimes this whistleblower legislation could be and I dare to say sometimes might be and even will be that somebody will try to uh, manipulate it with it. And of course, as a lawyer in private practice over 20 years, I have come across situations. 
right? So uh, just just out of my mind, how how do you say who is the uh, which let's say of top managers is the hardest to fire? Just in case there are some uh, you know no smoking gun situation, but still uh, you know which who would be it? Uh, fi finance manager, no? Uh, who? Head of legal, right? Okay. So, and imagine, so in, indeed a real situation. Head of legal knows that there is a problem. He, he or she has lost the competence from the, from the CEO, from the, from the management board, but the head of legal in, in, in one particular situation, you know, does every, you know, preparatory work for, uh, collects evidence that uh, of, of bossing, of, uh, victim, of, uh, of victimization, of the uh, facts that basically uh, uh, suddenly he, sh he or she says, why are you talking to me in English? We are here in Latvia, so he henceforth, uh, given all the instructions in Latvian language, I do not have in my employment contract that you need to talk to me, uh, can you can't talk to me in English, and you know, things like that, of course. And, and uh, of course, what would be the whistleblower's uh, implementation's uh, uh, response to this situation? So what, what, uh, what, uh, what such a case is, is about? So it is, of course, about an individual strategy to protect uh, this uh, person by uh, making some kind of, you know, deemed whistleblower reports. But actually, what is not whistleblowing? And we need to be very, very, uh, very uh, clear here two key things which this law says. For a whistleblower report to be a real one, it needs to be true. I mean, in the person's attitude, person has to be sure that what he or she reports represents the truth. It has to be, this is one of the tests. The other test is that if you whistleblow and this uh, whistleblowing object only relates to uh, your protection or let's say your uh, you are the only one who suffers a result as a result of misfunction as a result of uh, certain processes in the company that is also not a whistleblower report but of course it, I do not say that you do not have the protection for individual um, of course individual harms it is uh, other state institutions, it is the uh, state uh, employment board, state data inspections, and many others, right? So this law also talks about those two tests. It has to be truthful and it has to be more general than just yourself. So that is, that is a, a bit of a challenge of interpretation, how this law will be uh, applied in the future. So we also need to think, when we implement this in our companies, we need to uh, consider a professional attitude, a professional trained persons looking at these reports and being able to properly filter them, being able to properly understand them and properly deal with them. So that is, that is an implementation challenge. Um, yes, so um, system implementation costs. Well, yes, um, there, there will be certain costs, but are those costs massive? I mean, what do you need as a business to really do to implement this law? Um, it, it requires a certain system to be put in place. It usually would be a written policy or something. Is it enough just to have a written policy, tick the box, okay, so now I have implemented the whistleblower law, I am fully compliant. What else would a business do to, um, what, what you should do? Inform, train, right? So discuss, have this, uh, have this discussion that this is, I mean, uh, invite the people, have, um, have a chat. So that is, that is extremely important. And plus, of course, uh, regular follow-ups. And when it comes to the practice, everybody will look who will, how the quality of implementation. Will the person actually get the protection and will it be professionally handled? So that, I think, is uh, um, the key. Uh, the key. Uh, otherwise, like a cost, of course, the bigger companies 
and again, businesses here, have you felt the necessity uh, within your businesses to actually think about maybe not only head of legal, uh, legal function, but head of compliance, compliance function within your companies? And uh, let's say within the last year or so, is, th is, this, a, is this a trend? Yeah, I think I, th I, I, I hear, hear some nods. So, because we need, to, uh, we need to put it properly in the context. Whistleblowing law is not the only thing in this new, uh, let's say, approach that we need, that we need to implement. Tell me, uh, some other, tell me some other work streams that businesses are now working on in terms of um, what is KYC? Know your customer. Okay, so uh, what is about, you know, client identification? What is UBO? Ultimate beneficial owners. That is also, you know, going strong. Okay, so um, tell me, f no, f give me four letters of uh, extremely, uh, so uh, the, 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 the businesses love this regulation. Give me four letters for that. GDPR, of course, yes. So that is that is uh, another, you know, compliance. But you know, this compliance is uh, it is a necessity. It is, I mean, the banks require it and will require it. Our cooperation partners require it and will require it, and our businesses uh, require it. And we just need to understand that this whistleblowing is a very um, necessary. And it forms a piece of the uh, of the general compliance effort by the companies. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's see a bit a bit more. Uh, I think another challenge another challenge is um, the reaction and the speed of of um, of reaction by the businesses. I have something. Uh, I found it out recently. It's not a secret, but you need a little bit to look at it uh, in the um, in the internet jungles. So Danske Bank, okay? So I have a report uh, how uh, things got actually wrong there and why they got wrong so wrong there. So let me let me open some page uh, nine of the executive summary, and I will I will tell you why they why it got wrong. Okay, so. It tells, it was a whistleblower from the Estonian branch in late 2013 and, um, th and it made the group realize that AML procedures in the Estonian branch had been manifestly insufficient and in a inadequate and that all the lines of de defense, both within the branch and at the group level had failed, right? So this is, this is year 2013. Do we know or remember when the Danske scandal actually surfaced? Which year was it, more or less? 18, yes, something about 17. And how many years have passed since the whistleblower report in late 2013? More than three years, right? So I think this is this is another example how uh, I mean, and the business had all the information, and you know, when it takes more than three years, things naturally go uh, from bad to worse. And now we see shareholders' value destroyed, and and I can quote another so um, finding it says. Actions actually taken in 2014, because they did obviously something, uh, turned out to be insufficient with a number of processes not brought to an end and the allegations brought forward by the whistleblower were not properly investigated. Right, so the allegations brought forward by the whistleblower were not properly investigated. So again, this proper investigation and, and actually putting alive processes in place, you see how uh, important as a challenge it is for the businesses. And I will just, uh, I will, I think, you know, a couple of minutes still, a few, a few other things I want to say. It's the whistle, uh, again, the, the, the quality when you evaluate is it a whistleblower case? Is it not? Is sometimes a tough call. 
Um, we of course know, um, you know, it's also a public public knowledge about a case where a person says uh, he has been a whistleblower because of, uh, and it has to do something with uh, with the state prosecution. Says it was a state secret. The person says no, it was a whistleblowing report because you cannot say that a secret is information about corruption. Uh, but you see, there are two. Uh, again, two, two, uh, two sides of an argument, and a proper investigation also of this particular case will also signal how uh, our legal system is fit for dealing with such things. Um, also, in my personal practice, and I just, you know, before this, uh, before uh, the um, presentation started, I, I had a chat with 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 uh, with with the persons who know this case. But I just want again to say, um, we sometimes live in a world which we do not know and we don't even believe that such uh, things exist in Latvia. But as a lawyer, I took some, I took some pro bono cases in ch international child abduction cases, and I have had now eight of them. And you know what, what I saw, uh, a tendency, um, a, 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 a inter, uh, that these are, I mean, I, I work in uh, tough things, you know, financial industry and M&As and tough discussion, tough negotiations. But what I have experienced in those international child abduction cases is by far, uh, uh, you know, stressful, important, and and actually uh, so. And uh, just just example, a court hearing approaches, and the child is put in hospital. And, uh, and, and, and the system goes, and there are statements from the psychologists, psychiatrists, that the child needs uh, medical attention, and it's put in psychoneurological hospital. A child, uh, uh, six, five, seven years old, and, 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 and the court uh, uh, hearing ends, and next uh, court hearing is announced in a month, and guess what? The child is in that psychoneurological hospital back again. And that's what I thought. I mean, uh, and but in all, in all honesty, I see that's a putting a healthy child into psychoneurological hospital to foster the legal strategy of one of the parents. I thought it well. Is it an is it, it is, is it something just crazy happening in this case, or is it something like a like um, you know a tendency? And uh, having written to um, all sorts of. Uh, uh, Rights Protection Authorities Child Center, and you know, you name it. Within uh, now, within the six months, I have really have to credit our uh, basically our rights protector or ombudsman of Latvia. They have taken a general look, and you know what they found? They found that in 20% of cases, um, this, the court strategy has been that the childs have been in advance of court hearings put in those psychoneurological hospitals, and, and that is actually crazy. Did you know that, that such a parallel world exists? And, but I was just wondering, these doctors who prescribe this, these doctors who sign it off, they are, they are of course, competent experts. I mean, why nobody really blows the whistles on such situations. You see, I mean, you see through these cases, you need, but you need sometimes to be extremely vocal about it. You cannot put um, uh, healthy childs in, in psycho hospitals to foster your uh, court strategy. And now this is, this is changing. Uh, this attention is being brought to those particular doctors who are signing this off, their heads of chambers, their heads of uh, organizations. It is something which is, which, is, which is crazy. So I just wanted to, again, show that even in organized, even in organized situations and even in in, in very, very kind of well-managed processes, there is always to be, you need to watch the situation, you need to be attentive, you need to uh, report. So, but it's, it's sometimes, and, and in, this, in this child case, you cannot, of course, report it about it publicly, but that would be a major blow to, this, uh, to the child uh, himself or herself about the parents. You need to be properly discreet about it, but to a certain level, of course, you need to bring these issues up. Okay, and now just uh, just just to summarize, I, I wanted to to complete my uh, 
my, um, my presentation was this one. Again, an extremely important topic when we talk about the practical implementation of the law. So, uh, we have the, the black letter says the, uh, you know, the whistleblower is protected and everything. But to whom the whistleblower in the company should go? Because I am this extremely clear, clear um, advocate for the efficiency of the whistleblowing within the organization. The organization is not usually, of course, interested for it to go public. But the best success stories uh, tell when the whistleblowers have internally contributed and the organization has sorted it out. It has not been elevated uh, to prosecution authorities. And also, Ines's life will be a bit easier when most, you know, state chancellery, uh, you know, now it's easy, of course, to send everything to state chancellery, but, but the most important, uh, dear businessman, it would be that you put internally this system, a person of trust within the company who is first and best placed and enjoys the trust of the employees to, uh, to be this point of contact. And that's quite a challenge sometimes. And there are no right or wrong answers but i have put something on the slides and and but just just is is the is the management board the best uh, point of contact no but could it be it could be so no uh, of course i mean the management board it is on the top of our organization these whistleblower issues have to get properly summarized in any way so that they land on managers desks they take the proper attention but, but whether they are the only point of contact, yes, I, I agree with those who immediately said no. So uh, who, who would, uh, does HR department enjoy the trust of employees? Well, not uh, <laughs> because they also, you know, quite inclined to, of course. But, but uh, you know, but sometimes you can think of it. So um, supervisory board, the one which is on top of the management board. So that could be a solution, right? Because in the big companies, uh, the supervisory board looks after the interests of the shareholders, and that is the point of contact, uh, especially in, in, in the big organizations. They, they uh, by, by their office, they, they, they have to watch those bigger interests. Um, internal audit could be the head of internal audit. Could be, yes. So external contractor. You could uh, contract some, 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 would that be maybe an auditor or some compliance officer? Would that be an option in, in the bigger organizations? You know, I just, I want to say this is a food for thought because without putting a proper uh, contact uh, in, the, in the organization, this law may not be as alive as we would like it. But we would like it to be uh, a law which actually helps the uh, improvement of business level playing field for, uh, for also for local and international businesses in our country. And uh, much, much credit goes to you, Ines, for being the, the attorney and then basically really pushing it through. We just delivered the gentle supporting push to you, but without your, actually, this attitude, and you have gone through a number of things uh, and issues within this process, it would not have been possible. So let's give uh, a big uh, round of applause. That was, that was it uh, for the moment, and we remain, of course, very switched on for discussion. Thank you, Mr. Wynowskis. Uh, we've heard a very good summary from Ms. Kuschte, and they actually an impassioned argument for all companies to implement these whistleblower procedures to uh, implement the law from Mr. Wynowskis. And so listening to the two of you, I was thinking, is there anything you disagree on? Or is there anything that you feel that, that could be problematic in the law? I mean, I understand perhaps the law didn't cover as many areas as we might have hoped. It's maybe not as broad. We hope for its evolution. But even within the limits of what we can hope to achieve in this law, do you see things that might be problematic in implementation that where we could um, we'll have to pay special attention to make sure that they're actually done? I 
think uh, most of <laughs> the provisions may may be problematic. Uh, I think um, probably one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, looking from the side of the public uh, administration bodies is uh, how efficient uh, will be this uh, reporting to the competent authorities. Because the law provides that competent authority, uh, similar to our submission law, is uh, the authority that can solve this issue, fully or partially, which totally makes sense to me. Uh, there is no better solution, I believe, because the law already provides that uh, we, each authority has some competence. We don't need to have uh, some super police who will now have double responsibility for, I don't know, food safety, health safety, corruption. We have bodies for each of these different um, violations. But from the perspective of a citizen, today when he comes across this violation in uh, the work-related context, how he will find the responsible body, um, yeah, that's a, that's a question. If there are several bodies involved, how efficiently they will uh, come together and to, to resolve this issue. So, uh, and also the quality of reports. So all this kind of human factor and the uh, yeah, the number of reports could also be an issue because I think that's a factor of stress for many in setting the internal um, structures within the public bodies today as we really don't know how many reports there will be. And um, we're having um, courses for the um, officials of different state bodies uh, taking place right this week. And, uh, and we also yesterday spoke uh, had a speaker from our uh, revenue service and they also uh, told this interesting experience about the issue of uh, envelope uh, salaries and other uh, also violations uh, that uh, pertain to the state revenue service that they have put up this reporting channel that actually was for reports internally uh, which is Barka Pumevid Govelve it's kind of a special email where you can send uh, reports and how it start to live its own life <laughs> and that they have thousands of reports coming in and they have to follow up on them so and then yeah you don't you cannot really foresee entirely you can try but you cannot and i think this uh, unforeseen factor is the is is uh, is one of the challenges but there's certainly more yeah. just to add on this this is a real this is a real problem sometimes and also in the law it tells when a whistleblower report is received, one of the action points is to look, you know, whether there is somebody more competent than I to take a look at it, right? So, and then my, just my, 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 my feedback and my, but it, it's, it's, extremely, it's extremely good that the, that the head of uh, our government office, the state chancellery, is the center. And what I would like to facilitate as much as possible that these, one of, one of the biggest problems actually in our law implementation is the cooperation between the law enforcement agencies, be it state revenue service, economical police, uh, financial police, also, uh, let's say, the, 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 the bodies of prosecution, the bodies of, of... It is still one of the biggest problems. And if... Um, but my, my really advice, uh, you know, send, please, with the prime minister's um, signatures for those key uh, cases and, and request the institutions to report back. That is so important to, to, to put them, not that just, okay, send it over, uh, oh, out and forgotten. Request a feedback from these institutions. I think, I think that, is, that is extremely important to have the, the cooperation and feedback going. We have about 15 more minutes and I'd like to open the the floor for questions, because this, I think, is a very, uh, it's a radical new move, I think, in Latvian legislation, a very important move, potentially. What do you think, what kind of questions do you have for our experts? No questions. <laughs> there we go. I, if, if we could get a microphone over there, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I understand this is being live cast, so we're, yeah, we need we need a microphone. Can you hear me? Please, yeah. If you could introduce yourself as Sorry, well. Sorry, Oliver yeah. Bramwell from PMB Banker. Um, I had two questions, but I'll start with the second one. Uh, for false reporting, are the same? Are there any protections for anyone that's uh, making a false report or whistleblowing on untrue uh, facts? Um, and likewise, would there actually be potential sanctions for doing so, uh, encompassed within the law? Uh, 
part uh, to answer this question. Uh, the first is uh, generally about the authenticity of information. So the whistleblower uh, should believe that the information is truthful, has the reasonable grounds to believe that it's uh, the truth, and in the um, form of whistleblowing that we will um, invite everybody to use, uh, will be possibility to also really click that, uh, that I do believe this is truthful. Um, so um, only if the person uh, has an intention and is really aware that this is not truthful, uh, it's a problem. So I can believe something is truthful, but actually there is no violation, or I just uh, misunderstood. So um, I cannot always know that fully, but our goal of the law is to encourage whistleblowing, so that's why it's important that this case is, an, is not a problem also if I report something that is actually not a violation. However, uh, if I, with intention, report something that is false, uh, this is not a whistleblower report, as the law states. And moreover, uh, for a report, a false report, uh, so for a report that is uh, with intention uh, uh, wrongful, um, uh, there will be an administrative liability. So last week it was announced at the State Secretary's meeting as a, as a new legal act, and uh, it, so it should be adopted by the government and by the parliament, and then there will be a liability for false reporting as well. Okay, more questions? Yeah, please. Um. Uh, your presentation is very good from somebody. Uh, Eugene, I'm, I'm from Ireland. I'm here as a speaker. I've used the legislation since 2014, five years ago. And I just want to draw attention to one aspect of it. I, I think you've made an excellent presentation, first of all. But what escalation processes are in place? If an employer investigates it and comes back with no findings, and the person who makes it has concerns that it isn't being investigated properly. We, we refer to it as an escalation process. Where does it go? Just to draw attention to that aspect. Thank you. Maybe you could comment that? Uh, so you probably mean a case when there is no proper follow-up to the report. Is that correct? correct. Yeah. So uh, that's, I think, the whole idea of the street-tired approach of reporting, internally, externally, or disclosure to the public. So if you report internally and there is no follow-up, that's very easy. You can directly go to the competent authority. The law does not uh, uh, put any conditions for that. Uh, however, to report publicly, there are a bit more conditions that you have to respect. But still, the idea is that at a certain moment, uh, if there is no follow-up to the report without the reasons, then you go public. Question over there. It's about uh, the scope, actually. The if scope you could is. Uh, yeah, introduce yourself, I can see. Uh, I'm Maya Ockman, I'm from IF Insurance. So, and I'm asking about the scope. So, the areas which you can uh, report about whistleblowing are pretty broad ones. So, including uh, human rights uh, infringements. And under human rights, there can be many cases. So, it can be discrimination, so it can be. Uh, on, on whatever grounds. And actually, the protection of the whistleblowers are pretty broad. So including like uh, like release from the state fees or, or, or in the court or in some processes. So my concern is, wouldn't, can't the law be abused? So meaning that it's, it's, it's really broad one. So, and uh, the things which are actually the dispute, which is civil dispute or, or any administrative dispute can be somehow used So in, in that area. So bringing in uh, the name of your friend, so then you are, uh, if I'm representing my friend and uh, notifying about her or himself, uh, then uh, I, I'm there. So uh, I, I fall in under the law. And the second question is, is it really so that state councillor is a contact point even for private companies to whistleblow and notify as well. This is something what I can imply within the law. So, so um, yes, about, about the first, yes, indeed. 
You are right. When when drafting the law, there was kind of this short list, or actually a long list of the items which uh, can be uh, uh, of of uh, let's say. And I can just very quickly say, of course, it's it's bribery, it's it's corruption, it's it's uh, fraud, it's uh, competition law breaches, it's consumer protection, it's environment, it's uh, so, yeah, as as you said, human rights and. And actually, but I have to say, and others, right? Because the laws list is not extensive. This is just an example. And uh, but but again, uh, on this confidentiality, it is extremely important for businesses to protect their uh, commercial secret, right? To protect their uh, well GDPR. Yes, uh, this is this is uh, this is another uh, uh, key. Uh, obviously, uh, you know what the company needs to protect and. And, and other things, but I think, you know, the, the answer is just two things I want to say. A, it is this confidentiality of the whistleblower report and uh, actually anonymization of the whistleblower's identity, which is uh, a particular um, asset of this law, if I can say so, and also, but the biggest challenge is the professional review of the whistleblower report. And this person who professionally reviews it has to has a proper experience to pass it through those two key tests, whether uh, it is uh, well, it is it is a very very important test to analyze, but a very tough one, whether the information is truthful, yes, and the other thing whether the information is not designed just to protect this one private individual's private agenda. Uh, his or her private interests, his or her position against the company, um, and, and, and things like that. So that is not a whistleblower report and does not enjoy the protection of the law. But it's so, um, uh, so I'm just saying that one of the biggest challenges is to have professional review. And about the state chancellery as the, as the contact point. Yeah, very briefly, yes, this... Yeah. The state chancery is the contact point uh, for blowing the whistle and uh, you can blow the whistle internally uh, to the competent authority and uh, disclosing information public. So from that, yeah, we can deduct that also private uh, employees can um, use uh, the state chancery as intermediary to blow whistle about something happening in that company that uh, there is a competent authority that can deal with. Uh, for example, um, if we take the case of uh, you know, food uh, production, so there is an employee uh, who is observing uh, something uh, strange happening in the production of food that according to his professional knowledge is, um, can be dangerous for somebody to consume. So he would first uh, go to his employer uh, ideally, the employer um, stops the situation and that food is not sold. So nobody on the earth will know about it. <laughs> Only that employee and the, the company. But if nothing happens, that person should go to the competent authority that is in charge of food quality and that has the powers to control uh, companies. So uh, if that employee will not know where to go, then he will uh, contact the state chancery to either find out wh whom to report or he can send us his report. Then with a letter we'll forward to the uh, food uh, control um, authority and they will make the controls and hopefully if there is a violation stop it as this violation would certainly be in public interest because we will all not consume this dangerous food then. We have time. We have time for one more question. Yes. Well, okay, we'll do two. <laughs> but that's fine. Yeah. There. Okay. Please, and then the second question, and that's it. Then. Uh, you better have to. Yeah. Sorry. Can you please raise your hand? Uh, hello, I'm Louise Mantinha. I'm from. Uh, I'm pre representing Printful. We are a print-on-demand company. Uh, my question would be to Mr. Wynowskis. You said that uh, all, uh, we should also include in our whistleblowing system uh, service providers. Is there some kind of division which service providers should be included based on the functions they uh, offer to the company? For example, 
we could have service provider like PR agency and we could have suppliers. And they both offer different services and for example, some service providers only would have a very vague uh, knowledge about uh, our company and should they also be included in our internal system or no? So it's it's of course the the call of the current situation, but so I am talking about such service providers because um, many, at many times companies like uh, like your esteemed company, you're probably not doing everything in house, right? So you would have an outsourced IT uh, function. You would have probably an outsourced uh, set, and you know, do probably you do marketing with the partners. And sometimes those persons whom you outsource, on the one hand, they are just service providers. On the other hand, they are basically quite integrated in your daily operations, in your team. They are integral part of, uh, of, of your business, uh, business processes. And as such, they qualify as uh, whistleblowers in respect to your company. They need to be properly, therefore, protected, even if they are not your employees, even if they are not your uh, direct, uh, let's say, individuals like service providers, but even if they work for a company with whom you have a, a contract. So I was talking about such situations. Well, uh, we cannot go also, uh, of course, well, a, a totally distant service provider, like, uh, for instance, your, I don't know, your, your, your banker probably is not the whistleblower within your company, right? So they have, of course, other, uh, other ways and other way how they do report, but you need to see the proximity, right? So that is, that is basically uh, the, the, the call of evaluation. Uh, hello, thank you for presentation. Uh, my name is Waltz Karklins. I'm representing Pite. Uh, I just wonder how will you encourage private companies to obey this law if there are any sanctions? This is the one controversial. I will later explain about sanctions. You, now you say there are no sanctions. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, was there always since we worked on this law. I think in the first version, there was at least a timeline until which the internal system should be established, but then it was also um, uh, deleted. I, I personally believe that uh, the best things we achieve is not because we're forced to do them, because we really want to do them, I think, uh, well, I'm, I don't have a company and probably never will, but uh, I think uh, if I would uh, have to take care of an organization, I would like that things uh, are going well there and that my employees can openly speak about problems and that um, if there are problems that uh, nobody else learn about them, but I solve them myself. So uh, I think with this logic, it's only in the interest of the companies to have such internal mechanisms in place. Otherwise, your employees will go to the competent authorities and then uh, you will have uh, both reputational damages or maybe some financial losses. And uh, also some cases in other countries show that a uh, whistleblower report also prevents such uh, damage uh, that uh, is a bankruptcy of the company or some other severe uh, consequences. Um, so, bearing that in mind, um, yeah, there are no sanctions. Um, so... Um, if you don't establish such channel, uh, the employee will most probably come to the competent authority or, or try to report to you and uh, put himself in the danger because if there is no mechanism, then uh, there is no safe way to report. So I think it's in the interest of the company and we shall see if that works or not. In the guidelines, uh, we have uh, put um, a recommendation to um, uh, insert this information in your annual report that you have such a system and later on how many reports you have received. Uh, we will have annual reports by the state chancery where we'll have a section on internal reporting mechanisms. So we'll try to promote uh, good examples. Let's see what we do with bad examples with time.
actually there there is of course a, a general uh, administrative liability for failure to conf uh, comply with a legitimate request by a public authority so we could think about that so then also there is a uh, obviously within employment relations the state uh, employment service can find the employer with uh, for not complying with the laws and regulations relevant to the protection of employees' rights. So, I mean, broadly interpreted, I think there actually are uh, ways to uh, to apply, but most likely, I mean, it's not so much about penalizing, it's about so to to get, of course, this 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 system integrated into the DNA of of the of of the companies, big and small, and institutions, big and small. But also, I think I would say, as a lawyer, I think that employee would have a much better also standing on the claim of damages in case he or she litigates with the company or some uh, personal breach or, or or anything. If uh, if if um, if let's say the company is not compliant, and this is one of the one of the uh, examples why the company has failed to comply. So let's, uh, I mean, obviously there is not direct penalty, but but I think that this, uh, there is also not that there are no consequences at all. This is, this is a very interesting and broad topic, and naturally we've run a little bit over time. But uh, thank you, Ms. Kuste, Mr. Vinovskis. It's been a very interesting discussion. We now go to the coffee break, 15 minutes, and after that, Please be back here in 15 minutes so we can listen to our guest from Ireland. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Is it off? It, it's talking. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say big thanks to all three participants. And yes, I wanted just to ask you to wait a bit with your applauses because we have small souvenirs for each of them and certificates uh, of gratitude in order to thank you for your efforts and participation in this section. Please do the applause that I interrupted now. <laughs> you. And yes, as Paul said, uh, talking about sanctions, please be back in 15 minutes.
Everybody is back. I actually forgot that I have this important uh, instrument. I forgot forgot to use it myself. So, which we can use as a sanction if if you if people don't come back from 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 coffee breaks uh, early enough. So I will officially whistle blow a whistle. All right. Be relieved. I won't ask you to sing or whistle again. Uh, instead, I will I will proceed with the second section, and second section is a story of a real whistleblower, and we have a guest from Ireland, Eugene Lyons, who is a civil servant and former executive forza, and here we uh, have a big a bit of accident. Uh, but getting back to uh, Eugene, Eugene is a civil servant and former executive forza. Irish Trade Union for Public Service Stuff. Also, what is important for today is that Eugen is a whistleblower, a real life whistleblower. So, and today he will tell us how whistleblowing can bring positive organizational changes. Eugen, the floor is yours. It's childproof, I think. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me. This is the first occasion, because the process is confidential, that I've ever spoken to an audience in relation to this matter. So I'll ask you to bear with me, because I didn't bring slides on that. It's very easy to point out when legislation comes in how to make it work for the benefit of the employer, and as well as having benefit for the employees, because I can tell you that it's not easy entering a process that's laden with sanctions, and in particular where an employee may not be believed. We touched on that. There were some very good topics that didn't come to my mind when I started the process about how, what would happen if, for instance, somebody made um, a complaint and it wasn't deemed as valid. Now, just give you a little bit about myself. As Eva pointed out, I'm a civil servant, so I'm a government employee. In, in Ireland, the government and state sectors with private employees work hand in glove. There is a very peaceful environment, and it's based on what we call a partnership approach to doing business. And in many cases, research and development with this type of legislation is tried out in the public sector and then applied to the private sector in its applications. So I, I've been working for 38 years, that's quite a long time. Um, I've worked both in commercial side of the state as well as I worked in the taxes and revenue department. But more recently, an area in Ireland that has attracted a lot of controversy is the police department. I'm going to use, we have different names in Irish for them that we use, but I'm going to try and use universal language to explain it. In the department I'm in, we actually deal with whistleblowers. So I wear different hats, if I may say that. And when we started out, we had very little training or understanding of how it worked in practice. But that sort of fitted together, because initially I, an employer would be apprehensive about bringing in these new processes and how they would apply to them. In my own case, I work in a department called Internal Affairs. You may have heard this term. And we would deal with um, governance, accountability, and corruption within the police service. And that would include everything from, we, we had issues with terrorism, we had issues with use of firearms, we had issues with um, different aspects of, um, we'd get about 2,000 complaints a year from the public. It's very much based on um, customer-driven service. It's not, uh, we, we don't regard ourselves as enforcers, per se, because without the goodwill and cooperation of the public, we're not able to do business. So in my own capacity, I work in administration. I had access to all the senior officials in the organization. So as a whistleblower, I could contact the very top of the tree. We've 18,000 employees, just to give you a picture. We've six, 700 stations throughout the country. And the interesting thing about it was that for a big or small firm, the legislation which was introduced in Ireland in 2014, um, I don't know if you're familiar, we had a bank scandal, uh, the banks virtually collapsed, and those issues around governance and people being made aware, and as earlier speakers spoke in relation that everybody suffers when there's corruption, without exception. Every facet of corruption from the level of whether it's financial, whether it's bad HR practices, whatever is the end user is that we term that risks. What are the risks your organization? 
if an employee is in a position for any reason where the employer is liable for issues happening and there isn't much being done about it. But the issue about that arises when people go forward, it changes, we, we call it culture. What has happened in Ireland with the case law that has come from whistleblowing. Because when the whistleblowing legislation was introduced, there was no case law. And case law in our system determines how sanctions or how wrongdoing is measured. It isn't necessarily based on, and this is where, when it started out, our politicians didn't really fully comprehend or understand the impact this would have in our businesses, and particularly in our, in our public services. In my own issue, getting back to that briefly to explain what had happened, um, I used to be a senior executive in the public sector trade union, which was in partnership. We were never in conflict, and, and this might appear a bit different than here. So basically, they set the rules with government on pay conditions and if there was disputes. And I discovered quite by accident, because I had a revenue hat on, I was an auditor by profession, I discovered there was a discrepancy. Now, the legal term I have to use is always, you can't say that somebody did something without proving it. I had, didn't have sufficient proof. But there was six million euros unaccounted for. Six million. And in terms of the savings of the union, uh, as it were, um, they um, had about 10 million. So it wasn't like, it was a huge deal to them because this was the reserve fund, the rainy day fund that was there. The organization was well funded from membership subscriptions. Now the employer's aspect was that they deducted these deductions at source. So they collected the money for them. And then they were in partnership with them. So it was like subcontractor, you could regard it as a, a, an indirect outsourcing model. And the interesting thing was that there's rules governing friendly societies. There's rules, you get a license from government, so you have to obey certain rules. And in my eyes, this seemed to be a breach. So I raised several formal questions within the organization, not with my employer, and they weren't covered under the Act. This is the interesting thing. They weren't, I couldn't use the, now I, d I didn't know much about it, I have to confess at that time, but it, because it was just employees could use it, I, we had felt that it wasn't a sufficient instrument to use to bring knowledge to bear. Because knowledge, in using it wisely, brings cultural change. And that's by having the information we're learning here today, teaches us how we may address or bring stuff forward. So needless to say, I didn't get much leeway from them. And after a period in 2014, they made a complaint. Now, we, we mentioned the Chancery here. We have a department I, I don't think is that dissimilar. It's called Deeper. And they're responsible for public sector reform. They also control all government finance. And indirectly, all our wages through all the government departments are paid through it. So indirectly, they're my employer as well. But one of these senior, the general secretary in effect, made a complaint that I had accessed and used police computers and used that information for my own benefit and threatened certain parties with it. So here am I in a unit monitors and, and goes through complaints and suddenly I'm the subject of one myself. Uh, I wasn't made aware of it. My employer didn't tell me. You can imagine the police service operates in secret and the difficulty to a degree until they have the information. Often we say the police service is about control of information. So they had this information which came from the very top of the tree, the very senior manager. So it was deemed as very credible. I was totally oblivious to it. And it came to my own department, again through the police commissioner, and suddenly I was subject to investigation without being aware of it. So that's breach of our own laws in terms of you have natural justice and a right to reply in relation to stuff. So that escalated then from there where suddenly somebody said to me one day in the staff canteen, your good name is all you have. That's the highest value in this existence. And I said, I really don't know what you're on about. What are you on about? And they were surprised I didn't know about it. So I approached one of our senior investigators within the organization, and I'm in the head office department. I've access to everybody, which is in itself is very unusual. And they said, we, so they took me in for a meeting. And my HR director, normally it would be my first line manager, 
because you've 18,000 people, there's layers of management. So it was the very head of HR took me in. And he said, we received a complaint from the Department of Finance and it was alleged that you had accessed and used. And I was absolutely stunned. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, well, I have a right to know who made the complaint. You know, the right to information, these are within our laws. And me also being involved in the trade union, I was very, very familiar with internal procedures. And like initially, I wouldn't have thought of the Protected Disclosure Act at all. So I used the internal grievance procedures. And I discovered that they had gone through everything, my banks, everything. They'd gone through, did my whole biographical history at work. They checked the computers, and I was totally cleared of any allegations. So then I decided, now that that's out of the way, and I'm going to keep give you the short version, I said, I want to know who made the complaint. So they told me. They actually verbally told me. And they said, look, Eugene, it was by telephone. There's no written record. But because an investigation had been carried out without my knowledge, without my consent, I decided, okay, so I went to the head of our department. He'd been number two in the organization of Asian, just below the commissioner. And he told me he had received a phone call, went through the whole detail I've just shared with you. And uh, he said, uh, I'm only new. And I want you to, uh, he apologized. And he said, uh, because the complaint came from an external third party, which was thir a trade union, and through an, an anonymous source initially, but they told me then who it was and deeper, and I decided to see what I could information I could get. Now, not being familiar with the, the protected disclosure, I didn't even see the relevance of it at that stage. We shook hands on it. We agreed that it was a bad mistake and that he was new, and I put it down to that. But I continued to raise questions about the six million. We call it unaccounted for expenditure because that's all it was. I couldn't prove it one way or the other. And I discovered then, two years later, a second complaint arrived. Now this time it came in writing. And they went to discipline me for leaking sensitive, because as a government employee, you can't leak information. So I was in the position where I was leaking sensitive, confidential data about an organization without proof. But the bank statements told us what we needed to know, that the money was gone, and it was as simple as bank robbery in a sense, but we couldn't get reasonable explanations for it. We were within the rules of governance, within the organization, uh, because I was an executive member of it, and um, there's 80,000 people in it, just to give it a huge organization. And the interesting thing was that they couldn't qualify the simple questions we asked, and they wouldn't answer our correspondence. And they decided, well, we had a go at them. We'll have another lash at them. And this time I decided, and, I, and I'm leaving out a lot of the detail, to have a look at the protected disclosure legislation, which I knew nothing about, I have to confess. I did receive complaints. We put them through the process. We were the confidential recipients, the people you send them through. But it generally was about police matters. It wasn't about the administrative side of the organization. And I had been told it was just by telephone, and I figured nothing happens around here by telephone. So I did, you mentioned the GDPR I heard someone mentioning earlier. I decided I'd put that to good measure. And I found 65 emails from my top level manager to the top level manager in the government department. And so straight away, I sought the services of Transparency. Transparency International are here. We have Transparency Ireland. I was deeply suspicious of everyone. I have to say, I trusted nobody. And they gave me advice, and I did a draft of my protected, which is very simple to do, just five lines, excuse me, in the initial contact. And then I did a report on the basis of what we refer to as relevant wrongdoing. Now, the interesting thing was, I didn't have to prove it. I just had to, what they term, have a reasonable belief. And a reasonable belief is that, of course, we get people. And now, I deal with them today, and I, I would help people go through the process internally since this, because I'd be very familiar with it. And I suppose we have about 70 of them, to give for an organization of 18,000 over the last couple of years. Just to give you a figure, not many people use it. And the interesting thing, we've yet to find one, yet to find one that hasn't what we term a relevant wrongdoing. It doesn't mean that I'm correct or that my assumptions, 
my honestly held beliefs is that they're true, that they're not false. And the advantage was that it got worse because in our legislature, and I was asking the question earlier there because they refused to, it went to the police commissioner, and this is his senior executive member, and I'm just a reasonably low-level functionary foot soldier within the system, but it also would tell me whether it worked because I was very familiar with the processes. And in normal HR, if you'd normal HR issues, where someone would send us a protected disclosure, we'd say, look, does this cover any other policy? And if the organization is tuned in, it works very, very well. And so in my own case, and just get back to my own case if I may, and, and it, it's quite simple. They kept it for eight months. Now this is kicked off in middle of 2014. My protected disclosure went in in May 17. And in January 18, I still have no reply. So I go to, there's a judge appointed through the police complaint service. Now, there's eight monitoring services of the police department. There's eight different agencies. So I go to the judge in charge of the ombudsman's, we call it ombudsman's office, and I said, look, I'm going to make a complaint because they haven't escalated it. So they wrote back to me. Now, this was after almost four years. And they said, we've read your protected disclosure. We're off the opinion that it isn't a protected disclosure. And we're f they refuse to investigate it. And this is the fatal error that employers make, if I can say that. I then did my research and discovered that the confidential recipient I sent it to, which wasn't myself at this stage, had sought legal advice from the organization solicitor, who confirmed from day one it was a protected disclosure on seven grounds. There were seven breaches under the Act, potentially. And all we were saying, investigate. We weren't saying at this stage there was any wrongdoing. And I went back to Transparency, who I found as independent brokers. They, I had my own legal team. I, in, in our law, they don't give you free legal services. And I was blessed that I had very good legal advice. But it, I then discovered that not only had they appointed someone who wasn't going to investigate it, but that my own department or head had confirmed that it was a protected disclosure. And so I had two choices. And under our act, and I am abridging it because it is quite a long story, but I'm going to explain how our system worked. I went then to this judge and she said, you know, you can invoke section 10 of our act allows us to make a public, and that's why I asked the question earlier, so I had to go through each of the process. I did the informal when I initially made the complaint. I did the formal process. And because they refused to investigate it, I then went to the press. Now, as a government employee, you can't disclose. Under We call it the Official Secrets Act. You're, that would breach my contract. But what we did was we devised a strategy where we would leak components of it and take key names out of it. So it allowed us to put the issue, it's like somebody said, we sold the sizzle, not the steak. We gave them this much. And that started our public representatives, who we had primed, asking questions within our parliament. And the issue then was completely resolved. And the issue of compensation, because in that we've compensation, they'd come to me in the interim, I forgot to state that, and say, what would you take? How much? What would the check be to sign a confidentiality agreement? Every, we call it a stroke. Every opportunity to heal it or address it outside the act was put to me. And I said, look, it's not about money. I want you to disclose to me who the people made the complaint official. Because they told me the names. They had actually told me the names. And under our act, one of the uh, aspects of it was that I must come into contact with the issue in the course of my employment. So if I had heard the names outside work or through the trade union, which is not an employer, the actual protected disclosure was invalid. So we were in dispute, and we're still in dispute over this aspect because it's still going on. And the interesting thing was that they'd failed to disclose who made the malicious, and it was a malicious complaint that I had of the, and it may sound very simple, but I would have been removed from office. I would have lost my job. I would, I'm 38 years working. I would have lost my pension. Sounds as a worker, and I'm just sharing that. And in, so they have in Ireland, 
You may have heard about a tribunal recently. And th several of those areas impact on the policing service. And it isn't that because we don't receive that many complaints. And by and large, it works. But where the management of the organisation is, it protects itself when, and this has been established in public tribunals, where they put, and this is the reference used in it by, in legal speak, if I can use that, the reference was where they'd put loyalty ahead of integrity. And what that meant was they covered for each other in simple terms, I, and at a corporate level. But the police at a grassroots level is very respected. And the ordinary members, we would seldom get these complaints um, from in relation to how they do their duties, if I can put it that way. And so it would deal with the corporate management. Now, we're a big organization. And what it showed was that while they accepted that the complaint was valid, their legal department, at the top level, they'd say, well, we'll, we'll cover for A, B, or C. Now, they could have covered by addressing it, by releasing the information we were looking for, because that would remove it from my employment. If I was given formal correspondence stating, these are the three parties who, because they then would be under the Act. One aspect of our Act is that the Defamation Act is increased six years where a protected disclosure stands up. Now, normally, it's 12 months. And these are the instruments that our legal people would use to extract. Now, I've, put, I've declared that even though I would be, and, and I feel confident if the case was heard, I would win the defamation suit if I got the names. I have given a waiver saying, I don't want any money. There's a homeless shelter down the village. You can give it to them. This isn't about the money. This is about relevant wrongdoing and the facilitation by my employer to sanction a member of staff for queries I was relating in relating to in relation to an external party. Now they weren't a contractor, so they weren't covered under the Act. So on that end, what we decided to do was we raised the new legislation in Ireland for the protected disclosures. And we've added two aspects of it because under the Act, one of the weaknesses we discovered was compelability. How do you make somebody stand up and say, we messed up, because that's not in our nature, I think, generally speaking. And the compelability under the Act is to increase the sanctions or remove people from office. In other words, if you're a company, you have to have a license, and if your company is found seriously wanting, and I'm, it's not over light offences, that their license will be taken off them. And that's a pretty heavy sanction. Their capacity to trade for five years, now, it would have to be very extreme. But this is where we would see the... And I'm not saying that to alarm anybody, but the idea is to make the legislation work for the benefit of society, is, is the rule of thumb. And the stuff that we've got in terms of how the Act has been used, in Ireland it has been mainly about law enforcement, law, uh, about the policing service. Mo a lot of them have come from that source. And they've ran a tribunal through the Oireachtas, through the, we call it the Dáil or the Parliament, and what they've done is they have opened up the inquiry, and it's really about lessons learned, introducing new processes, how you communicate. Because in my case, if HR had functioned properly as it should, there would never have been any complaint. I've never met a complaint in my life. And the key to organisation, and I'm just sharing that in terms of what happened, uh, it's how they protect the house as a, at the expense of what's right, in a nutshell. When it's easily resolved, uh, the interesting thing is our executive director in HR has been suspended. We've had two resignations of commissioners. They're gone. We've had two ministers replaced. So if that's not an effective outcome to the legislation. Now, in all cases, there probably was no financial sanction to them. But the idea of accountability, we call it governance and accountability. In the department I'm in, we deal with corruption within the police service. And we used to have 10 staff. We will now have 400 very shortly. So the organization's response to addressing the issues that have been raised is phenomenal. And, and what we do is, when the legislation is, comes in, organizations just need to adapt and start changing processes. The most interesting thing I heard today, and I think it's so true, is that the communication between 
the contact person and the employee is essential. And it can be anywhere. Now, ideally, HR in our case would have those people. We have a welfare service. Welfare service would look after staff. Now, keep in mind, we have 18,000 employees. And so we have set a number of contacts up in the system to assist with how, what the best way to progress it. And, and it works very, very well. And um, most of the issues are resolved. So I'm just conscious of my time here. So I'm going to, uh, you know, look at how we, just to finish, if I may, is that the legislation will go through different phases. I, if it comes in and it's not, it needs tweaking or changing, that option is always there up to your parliament. And like what will work will be acknowledged, but if something needs changing, and but the idea of um, openness and transparency is definitely the future. Europe are now trying to lead the way, and I think it's to the benefit of all. But I want to thank you again for inviting me here today, and I'm going to invite anyone that wants to ask any questions or anything that may clarify anything I've said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eugen. Are there any questions for Eugen? Please go on. I will try to hand you over the micro. Uh, thank you, Eugen. My name is Ingrida Karenja Bersinja, American Chamber of Commerce. It's like a who done it. So, did you find the six million? That particular aspect of that unit had lost their license. They ran out of money, surprise, surprise. So they were merged <laughs> into a much larger organization, and the first steps they took was to remove the three executives. Now, they're still there, because in Ireland, we, we tend to be tolerant towards, shall we say, potential wrongdoing. There was nothing proven against them, but the first thing they thought was moot was that, and there was more to it how I found out was the law of unintended consequences a colleague who was a trustee and a, one of the financial people had recorded a meeting she was at where the whole case was put. I didn't know what it was about. And the financial director was afraid of losing his job. So that's what the motivation of making the complaint was. And all we were looking for was an internal auditor. We, weren't even, we didn't even think that at any stage it was at the level it was. The money, uh, because it's a private organization, even though they have a license, um, once it wasn't asked by the shareholders, which was the members in this case, nobody, they, like, they all knew about it. But they were removed from office and given other positions. Uh, under one of our laws, uh, in, in, in labor law, they weren't at a loss financially of salary, but they had no access, future access to funds. And what they did effectively was use the members' funds as their own slush fund, effectively. And, you know, this is quite common in the, with a voluntary sector in Ireland where there would seem to be inadequate regulation, I would argue, and we, we've tried to bring a bill in. Um, we have it currently with the Football Association where the key people at the top would use the organization's funds as their own personal bank. It, and I'm minimizing it without having hard evidence, but we've had this in about four trade unions. We've had a charity company. So there's been maybe, I'd say, close on 10 individual uh, examples of where the governance isn't right. But this is where the government are now looking at bringing in governance. Legislation, and, and I'm using the model here, takes between 10 and 15 years. So it, it's quite slow. But they did find, the, it, it certainly was validated, shall we say. But if I was given the names by my employer, I then could seek discovery of their bank and everything. And, but that hasn't happened yet. But my employer also was, remember my employer was the only one that sanctioned me. What they did was they moved me, they cut my wages, I didn't get into that. And I kind of thought that was what motivated me. And we have a thing with public investigations in Ireland that says beware of disgruntled employees. Now I wasn't disgruntled because the team around me have a wonderful work and relationship. They know I'm here, they know I'm speaking, and there's been no enmity whatsoever between me and my line managers. In fact, one of them proposed that I use the legislation. And that was an organization that was open. They said, OK, we confirmed that they got legal advice, that it was a protected disclosure. And even though they failed to investigate, it gave me the opportunity to use the public disclosure. 
which I didn't have up to that. Now, I kept it to a minimum, but when that general secretary read the Thunder newspaper, I got front page, and it explained and named them. And the interesting thing was that uh, he never pursued me, because under defamation, if I couldn't prove it. But the act protected me, because I could show the pattern of steps were completed, and that we followed it to its conclusion. And that, in essence, it worked very uh, effectively, shall we say. But no, it, I still didn't get everything I wanted by any means. But what I did was that I was fully exonerated and cleared, and there was no question. I used to have a boss that told me, he said at the time, if you can't make them love you, make them afraid of you. And I know that's a terrible statement to make. But in jest, he said this to me. that, wh And that's what tends to happen with employers who are not sensitive communication-wise. It's all about communication. But I didn't have any difficulty with them, and I didn't need to do that with my employer. But the interesting thing was, but it all ended up incrementally. And then the other issues raised by other whistleblowers rem removed two of our commissioners and two ministers. And I think that's a success story as a direct result of the act. And the act brought it all out in the open. It helped to, and, and because we don't tend to be hard on it, you know, it wasn't a, they weren't overtly sanctioned. They, there was a little bit of discrediting, but the evidence was so overwhelming and they could have gone to the courts and sought redress if it didn't work. So it did work in those cases as well. Thank you very much, Thank Eugen. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes, please, Wald, but as we are really short on time, be, please be concise. So, Eugen, three tips. One. First is to get documentation. GDPR is very helpful. To, to get good legal advice so that you're not... You, because you don't be objective, if I can say that. You have to be objective. And the third thing would be be honest with themselves and everybody and, and stay with them. Because there were several times I could have pulled it. And they tried to incentivize me to withdraw the process because of the public nature of it and because of other potential scandals that were in the media. The interesting thing was I was in court this week with another case because I now teach others how to use the process. And uh, she was locked up for 20 hours, this employee, by the police over a medical certificate. They accessed her medical data without a warrant. And the judge went to town. It. And this person was off payroll for four years. So she was sanctioned. She went through the legal process. And they used, which is very unusual, a misinterpretation of the act. So others who use it, like me, from teaching others, is that try and find an advocate or a good advisor in terms of how the process should work. And don't take it personal, I would say. That's the fourth thing, if I may, is you can't afford to take it personal. Great answer. So documentation, legal advice, and be honest and uh, seek professional help. So thank you, Eugen, very much. With this, we do finish our second section. Please give a big round of applauses. <laughs> and now we are proceeding to the third section. And it's my honor to introduce uh, my colleague and uh, Transparency International Latvia expert on whistleblowing procedures, Janis Veide. No applauses? <laughs> You're so tired already. All right, I will, I will hand over the micro to Janis and he will introduce you, uh, the other participants of the panel. Thanks. Hello everyone, hello, As uh, yeah, thanks to Eva, thanks everyone who is still here. Uh, so, my name is Jan Svede, I'm working for Transparency International as a lawyer legal consultant for uh, whistleblowers and all together with the uh, state chancellery and this magical lady Ines, uh, we somehow managed to get to whistleblower protection law in Latvia. So, uh, may I please uh, ask to join me the panelists Evita, Francis and Devo Devora while I will just say some few inter introduction words. So, as you know, uh, there is a saying, not all heroes wear capes. And uh, I think this can be addressed to the whistleblowers for sure, uh, because not only they don't wear capes, uh, usually we don't know their identity. But we have to remain uh, remember that these persons are those who are not afraid to raise awareness on problems, even knowing that they could uh, have 
big problems and have big consequences, not only for them, but for their families. So in this panel, we will talk about mechanisms, how they should be uh, installed and how they should be made in the company. So these heroes don't have to be afraid of the consequences and they don't have problems to blow a whistle. And as you know, I have joined now here the three most fabulous speakers in here. And each uh, one of them will have 15 minutes. Please be uh, there like for 15 minutes only. I will try to stop stop you. And after afterwards, we will have, uh, I hope we will have still time for uh, uh, questions. And um, first, I will give word to Evita, Evita Gosha. Evita is boss. I'm sorry. Evita is legal uh, director and management uh, uh, in management board of CIA Semex in Latvia. Evita practices business law in several leading companies in Latvia. Evita is a diver diversity management expert and deals with the strategic litigation in matters related to human rights. So. And that's the official part. Then I asked, Evita, could you please tell me the first thing what comes in your mind when I say whistleblower? And she answered me, proper protection and prohib prohibition of revenge. So, Evita, the floor is yours. Do you hear me through mic? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. I'm always uh, very delighted uh, to talk about issues I'm passionate about. And um, this issue is definitely uh, one of those. And uh, I would like to uh, explain uh, how we deal with this issue uh, in CEMEX, how we have dealt with that uh, already for quite some time, for many years actually. And uh, so for us, this is nothing new, and we are simply happy that finally this is uh, also a law, and that uh, all the companies uh, fulfilling the uh, certain requirements will have to uh, handle these issues. Um, a couple of words about the company I work for. Uh, this is a very old company actually, uh, 113 years old. Uh, it, it is currently present in more than uh, 50 countries in the world. It employs more than 40,000 uh, em employees worldwide. And it is one of the leading building materials producers uh, in the world. And uh, for Latvia, uh, it is uh, still uh, the biggest foreign industrial investor in Latvia with a total investment uh, of around 352 million. Um, um, it is really important uh, to, uh, to talk not just about the whistleblowing mechanism, uh, simply as a technical mechanism. Um, CEMEX is a company uh, that uh, really, uh, let's say, um, has uh, a clear uh, business culture uh, uh, into which actually this whistle whistleblowing mechanism uh, fits in and, and really builds an integral part of this business culture. And therefore, I would like to start with, uh, with, uh, with speaking about the values of CEMEX, uh, which are defined in the Code of Ethics and Business Conduct uh, of CEMEX, and, uh, and uh, you will understand why I, I want to, uh, to start with, the, with, with these values, because these are really the uh, principles that guide our behaviors. Um, and uh, safety first, uh, this is always, uh, let's say, the most important issue. Uh, no money, no nothing is more important than safety. All management meetings start with safety uh, issues. Uh, even management bonuses are based on, on safety issues as well and, and so forth. So ensuring safety is uh, value number one in CEMEX. Uh, next, focus on customers. Uh, third, pursue excellence. So compliance, uh, being uh, the best in the industry, uh, trying to uh, pursue the best the best best practices, to live the best practices, to believe in them. Uh, this is also a very important value for for our company. 
to work as one CEMEX and to act with integrity. And I think this value is one of the most important uh, values in the company, also with respect to whistleblowing, uh, because um, uh, living up to, uh, to all our commitments, uh, doing what we say, uh, acting with honesty and transparency, this is a very important uh, value for, for our company. Uh, compliance is our DNA. Uh, so compliance is basically everything, uh, starting with the, with the external legal enactments, continuing with the, with the code of ethics and business conduct, which is uh, uh, also a very important instrument, uh, meaning that uh, all the employees in our company uh, have to sign uh, the uh, code of ethics and business conduct, uh, and it forms uh, an integral part of, uh, of employment contracts. Um, this code of ethics uh, also sets uh, the clear whistleblowing mechanism, which I will describe a little bit later. And of course, uh, internal policies and procedures. Uh, so, about the uh, technical whistleblowing itself. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, it is defined in our code of ethics. And uh, so the code of ethics basically uh, describes uh, the, uh, the behaviors uh, of, uh, of, of employees, of, of our subcontractors, uh, even uh, of our customers uh, in, in certain, certain areas. And, uh, and it also clearly uh, defines uh, how issues may be raised, uh, how suggestions can be made, um, and uh, how uh, this reporting can be made. Um, and uh, I will, uh, I will uh, go into detail uh, how this mechanism actually is formed. Basically, what are the channels, uh, how uh, reporting uh, violations uh, can be carried out. Uh, one of the uh, ways is the so-called ethos line. Uh, it is basically a website which is uh, managed, uh, and, and not just a website, but, but the whole system. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, of reporting, and it is managed by a, a third party, by an outsourced company, by Cemex. And as you can see here, I really like uh, the setup of, of this web page in a way that we can see very clearly that, uh, first of all, it is uh, reachable uh, in all the languages which are spoken in, in Cemex. Uh, I mean, official languages. Uh, we, here we can see that Latvian is also there. Uh, and we can... Uh, see the main principles. Uh, uh, first of all, we see that uh, this tool is accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, if we still have some doubts, if we want to report or, or, or ask uh, questions, we have code of ethics at hand, so we can take the last look before submitting a report if we want to. And uh, here Temex also mentions that uh, it wants to ensure that its values remain alive and that the code of ethics uh, be adequately managed and uh, that all employees, other stakeholders and the public in general uh, are encouraged to submit suggestions, inquiry, inquiries and possible violations. And that any kind of comments, requests or other inquiries may be submitted. And, uh, and you can also remain anonymous but, of course, it is recommended that uh, you provide as much detail of, of what you want to report uh, as, as, as possible, simply to, to obtain more information if need be, and, and so forth. And uh, here we can also see uh, the ways how to report through ethos line. So one is uh, uh, the online report. So if we would click on this uh, icon, uh, online, click here. So there, there we, we would see, uh, let's say, uh, a setup of, uh, uh, for, uh, for, for pro provision of, of information. Maybe it is even easier because then you have like, a, like a, some kind of framework how, how you should do that, not just a blank page in, in front of you. Uh, you can also submit a report uh, via telephone. So if you press the next icon, then, uh, then you uh, see numbers which you, can, uh, which you can call depending on the country. And uh, you can also submit uh, your report via email. Um, I don't know how I can go back, but uh, uh, but uh, in any case, so that was the first channel. Um, 
Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, the next channel is, of course, immediate supervisor. If a person trusts his or her supervisor, then, of course, uh, the report can be, uh, can be made uh, to, to that person. Then human resources department or legal department uh, or uh, the so-called business unit ethics committee. Business uh, unit in that context means uh, uh, the specific ethics committee uh, of the particular CEMEX entity. For instance, in Latvia, CIA CEMEX is the... Uh, uh, CEMEX business unit in Latvia, and uh, we have an uh, ethics committee consisting of uh, six members. There are two permanent uh, members, uh, the head of legal department, the head of uh, HR department, and the rest change from time to time. They are, uh, usually, these members are appointed by the, uh, by the country manager, and uh, they uh, are uh, chosen, of course, based on reputation, uh, of these uh, employees, but also uh, we take care of, uh, of the issue that, that they also represent uh, the whole of our business, meaning that these are not simply just, all, let, let's say, not that all members are from administration, but that they also represent, for instance, ready mix production or cement production and so forth. So basically trying to cover the whole business we, we have. So. Um, and of course, when uh, when investigating the cases, uh, uh, not all of these six members have to participate. So it's usually at least two or three members, uh, again, taking into consideration the possible conflicts of interests and, and so forth. And then if we already look uh, more globally to, to our company, then this is the global CEMEX ethics committee, usually. So uh, uh, it would deal, of course, with the cases not related to, uh, to, to maybe uh, local employees, but, but, but uh, CEOs and, and, and like uh, regional directors and so forth. And uh, when financial, uh, like more or less, I would say, serious uh, financial issues are involved uh, then uh, audit committee of the board of directors this would also uh, this is also more or less regional and, and, and global level of the company uh, but uh, yeah as as I s as really we we can say that uh, ethos line is uh, has been uh, has been used also for uh, for 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 in case of latvia also but basically all the channels uh, at the local level uh, have been used uh, in our case <coughs> uh, what we really uh, take um, take care of uh, is that uh, the code of ethics uh, and business conduct in CEMEX has this universal character for the company. So basically, irrespective of the status of the company, uh, nobody uh, can be an exception. So. Uh, also in Latvian case, I can, I can of course, on no name basis say that uh, that we have had cases uh, or at least investigations against board members, for instance. So nobody is an exception, and I think this is a really good signal for the employees that there are no exceptions, that nobody can be protected. Um, which is what, what is also really uh, relevant is that uh, we investigate all the reports and. Uh, uh, we also take into consideration the fact that uh, sometimes, so usually these are uh, issues that, that are emphasized, I mean, like based on, on, on experience, that, uh, that, that whistleblowers, for instance, or, or other people who submit some kind of, I don't know, suggestions or, 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 or comments, that they don't get any feedback. So we, uh, we really uh, take this into account and we give this feedback as soon as possible. And that uh, absolutely all, uh, inv uh, all uh, reports uh, anonymous or, or, or submitted with, with names are being investi investigated. Uh, we also take care of uh, the uh, time factor. Um, we uh, try to investigate the cases uh, not longer than uh, one month. Uh, also uh, due to the uh, practical reasons, meaning that according to the uh, employment law, if uh, disciplinary measures uh, have to be uh, imposed on somebody, then actually it can, it can be done within a month uh, from discovery of, uh, of, of a violation. So we take uh, this matter of time into consideration as well. And actually, uh, there is no benefit of, uh, of uh, trying to prolong the solution of, of the case. 
uh, of course, confidentiality, uh, as a matter of fact, and uh, as uh, Janis already mentioned, uh, my first reaction to, uh, to, to whistleblower or whistleblowing uh, concept itself uh, is zero tolerance for retaliation. This is, a, this is something that we keep on repeating all the time, so uh, this is really uh, a part of our DNA, no retaliation for uh, whistleblowers. Uh, in basically, what we say is that uh, if retaliation takes place, then this is a violation per se. This is a second violation, basically. So um, uh, this, 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 this can't be tolerated. So these are trainings. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the Code of Ethics is the uh, uh, part of, uh, of uh, employment relationship. Uh, there is an initial training of, uh, of employees uh, starting uh, the employment relationship. Uh, there are uh, uh, trainings, uh, let's say, at least once, uh, once in a year, uh, once in two years, and, and, and these, these, these issues are emphasized all the time. Uh, we also believe that uh, not just this whistleblowing, like technical whistleblowing uh, processes, is relevant. Uh, as I already said, uh, they, our business culture, uh, is built in a way that uh, people uh, can trust the company, can trust the management, uh, can be uh, open about their concerns. Uh, we have a system, for instance, of uh, risk cards, which is a health and safety issue, but uh, people, whenever they notice something, be it in a plant, be it in the office, be it with respect to uh, some kind of objects, like unsafe objects, or be it with respect to unsafe behavior of, of a colleague, uh, not wearing PPEs or, or anything else, they can, they can write these risk cards. And uh, let me tell you that if in 2009 we had 200 something cards per year, last year we had two and a half thousands of a uh, thousand of, of these risk cards, which doesn't mean that we are bad. That actually we have a much higher standard in health and safety issues uh, than uh, than required by law in Latvia. But just that people are not afraid to report, and they report what what when, what whatever they they see and they they want to report. And, and they also receive that feedback, and that's why they are not afraid and they see a point to report that, that they get this feedback. And then there are other mechanisms like ISO certification, like process assessments, uh, like regular meetings uh, of teams, of management and employees, and, and we have uh, also uh, mailboxes installed in the offices and in the plants. And uh, then, as I mentioned, this um, comprehensive encouragement to speak out, to submit suggestions, and, and so forth, which is repeated all the time. Basically, through our work, this is, uh, this is being done. Open door policy, what we have, and promotion of diversity and inclusion, which we have, and I see Janis waving all the time. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I probably won't, uh, won't go into details uh, 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 with respect to uh, to the benefits, which you most likely discussed already, but I truly believe, really based on uh, empirical ex experience uh, of, 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 our, of our systems in, in place, I truly believe in these benefits. And uh, let me tell you, uh, for, let's say, even to the most skeptical uh, of you, who maybe still uh, somehow uh, Look back at the, you know, at this horrible Soviet heritage of, you know, somehow, you know, seeing, you know, uh, this strange link between that time and 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 this whistleblowing concept. I can I can simply say that uh, that the reports we have uh, received actually were really uh, even let's say had financial benefits for our company. As I said, we comply and we, I hope we won't. Uh, uh, have uh, like really huge cases, you know, when when like uh, uh, non-compliance uh, uh, issues uh, are covered, you know, that we see that really, you know, our company has done, you know, like something like really, really bad. But uh, from these reports we have received, we have improved our processes in a way that we have really averted losses, you know, caused by our subcontractors, caused by our employees, you know, by negligence, you know, by, by, by uh, dishonest actions and so forth. This is for, for us. I mean, uh, at the same time, like, it is for the society, for the people, but this is also for the company. It's, 
Uh, it's selfish, but it is, it is like that. I mean, it's also for the company. So, sorry, Yanis. Thank you. This one? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Evita. Yeah, we can see that the company can actually benefit from a whistleblower tools and from a whistle safely installed whistleblower mechanisms. And uh, I think that's the selling point for all the companies and that how it should be. And we all should remember that the whistleblowing and whistleblowers are the cheapest way to find the problems in your company. So, and the next speaker that I can present you today is Francis Harmon. Francis is an American uh, expert on internal control and business risk focused on the operational effectiveness. He has investigated many whistleblower issues for major comp corporations and government agencies. So Francis, uh, it was kind of hard to understand what you answered to me when I asked you what is whistleblower or what's the first thing that comes into your mind when I say whistleblower. He just answered me, it's just normal. So. The floor is yours, and you are 15 minutes with the uh, normal stuff as a whistleblower. This works, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really at the other end of this whistleblower. I'm really at the other end of this whistleblower thing from Eugene. I was very impressed by his presentation. I got to say, I mean, he's a that basically should be seen by us as a hero of this particular uh, thing. So shout out to Eugene there. The, um, my job is more, I've been a CEO of uh, global companies and, and uh, I'm now the chairman of this little group of companies, Inc. Blue, where we've been around for 31 years. Uh, we're looking to move our way into the Baltic in NASA. Uh, to the mouth? Yeah. Okay, it was good. Maybe I should just shout. I was in the military. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so Ines is actually based in our Helsinki office, and we're looking, I kind of like Latvia and want to be here. So that's why we're here. The, um, can you move the, the thing? Yeah, I think I, I wanted to say something about the US approach. As our um, ambassador's representative earlier on was saying, the first whistleblower law was back in the 1700s. It goes with our culture. It's, it's a culture of freedom and a culture of free speech. I can say what I like here. You can throw things at me and you can argue with me, but I can say what I like. This, is, this, is, oh, sorry, this isn't America. I just arrived from America. But this is the US. We can say whatever we want. And there's often a great cultural respect for the whistleblower. Um, the people that helped, you know, there was the movie about uh, unfortunately, the Nixon era, you know, it was, they just hear the, the deep throat that was telling the journalists what was going on. There's that cultural kind of respect for that. We've had this federal legislation for 200 years. I looked at the Department of Labor for the number of whistleblower acts. That's the federal Department of Labor. There were two pages listed. Um, we also have 50 states that have their own whistleblower legislation. So my answer to Giannis just earlier on, was actually true. It, I, I don't even think about it. As a, as a CEO, I've had whistleblower uh, things come to me. I'm not going to talk about them. I'll just tell you what I've done. I'm ruthless. I just deal with whatever the fault is, if it's proved, and I get it done quickly. And that's what I advise people to do. I don't want people struggling for years like Eugene did. That's ridiculous. And it's not good for your business. It's not good at all. Um, this, the SOX Act in 2002, that then brought in a lot of stuff in terms of financial uh, uh, within corporations. And corporations reacted that, to that in their own way, each, each different. Um, they just have to comply. They talk to all the best lawyers. They get the best advice. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a business person. I talk to the lawyers if I need to know the details. Would you move that? Uh... Oh, yeah, keep moving. <laughs> I wanted to talk about this briefly some companies that we've been involved with as a, so Ford Motor Company, we 
spent a number of years, uh, one of our consultants was there doing a lot of things. I'm really impressed with that. I'm going to show a statement from Bill Ford in a moment. But um, they didn't just say, oh, we have to have some kind of whistleblower thing. What they did is produce a 65-page book that I could wave here. It's, um, oh, I could read it to you. Have I got an hour? But it's, um, they, they really took it seriously. They spread it out. We don't, they didn't just say what's required by the law, but started talking about as uh, Semtex, is it Semtex, Semex? Sem Semex. They, the Ford Motor Company decided, it's a $160 billion company, that they wanted everybody throughout the organization to feel that if they find things wrong, they can tell somebody. And an interesting thing about it, when you read the en enormous manual, there are so many routes to be able to tell people. You can, you can phone this number, you can send an email here, you can contact the, the group, uh, whatever they call it, the attorney. You can do all these, you can names and email addresses and physical addresses, large numbers of them. And a promise not to retaliate in any way. And you can do that when you're huge and when it's still controlled by a family with a guy like Bill Ford in, in charge of it. Microsoft, one of our people put in a lot of their internal controls uh, shortly after, after uh, over there in Seattle. And um, they're just more matter of fact. They're pretty good. They've tended to go with, this is how you do it, rather than this is what our, into, uh, our values are. They talk about their values, they're good values but they've tended to make it very mechanical. This is exactly how you do it, and these are the alternative ways to do it. The small SEC registrants, they've done it a different way again, typically, because they can't afford all these things. The companies we work with, I mean, in a country of 330 million people, I can't talk for the whole country, I can only talk for companies that we work with, they tend to use either external legal um, operations or they use uh, their in-house counsel to receive complaints. I, I'll call them complaints because I guess they are. So the, typically what's going to happen is you're given the address or the phone number of somebody to call. The best ones, the ones we recommend, actually use an external service. I mean somebody like Transparency International should go into business and do this, where you've got a toll-free number. So if you're working for XYZ Corporation and you suddenly find that they're doing fake tenders to some government department or something like that, whatever, whatever it is, you phone this 1-800 number and it gets registered, it gets um, initially investigated, and then people like us or people like the police, depending on what kind of complaint it is, they, they develop it. They, they investigated. Can you keep this moving? I've only got 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to read this to you, but I think it's something worth uh, knowing about. As he starts off, I mean, Henry Ford's got some dubious uh, background, particularly originally in dealing with unions. D that grew out of that in the late 30s. There's a most intimate connection between decency and good business. And that, to me, is also something that if I, if I would have thought of it, I would have said. I think, you know, we operate our business as well, and I hope everybody here does, where we just keep the, you know, ancient values of providing good value and trying to do the right thing. And you hear that so much, in, at least among the clients we work with, from senior executives. We just want to do the right thing. Uh, we can move on. I don't want everybody reading all of that. Some of the practicalities, uh, I, I've got to keep an eye on that clock there. I want to talk about some cases that we've investigated. Nothing that, um, a couple of them have been in the newspapers. And if uh, I still have time, I've got another 200 cases to talk about. So. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, this is, this is a typical, typical thing. This is a very, very large uh, government department. I don't even need to tell you the country because you can probably tell by my voice, I worked for 20 years in Australia. I was sent there from the US and came back. So I'm not even telling you what country or state it's in. But it was a very, very large government department. And we received a whistleblower complaint that was referred to me to investigate, where the CIO was apparently 
doing things, fiddling how he recorded expenditures. And it was a fairly um, simple thing. It seemed like a, a little bit too technical for me. What he was doing was in capital projects, sorry, I'm going, I don't want to talk about accounting, but with, with capital projects, you can accumulate all the costs of doing things, including travel costs and stuff like that. And somebody made what was really an incorrect, not, not badly thought out, a badly um, intended, an incorrect whistleblower complaint that the guy was doing accounting wrongly in order to hide over expenditure in his budget. Well, I did a, I personally did it because of the seniority of the guy, and no, nope, he'd done it right. Unfortunately, because I was investigating, I then found other things that he had done wrong. So this is, this is one of the things, sometimes you know, there's a saying in English, there's no smoke without fire. So the very fact that somebody um, had the idea that they thought they needed to report him for something probably gave an indication that he wasn't really on, totally on the up and up. So what we, I forgot I can move around with this microphone. <laughs> so what, what we found was something fairly serious. He had left the next day after I reported it and whatever the government did after that is really their, um, their thing. I didn't have any, any issue with it. This particular government doesn't appear to have been like the uh, Garda Shukana or whatever, you know, so. <laughs> I, I go to the next, oh. Th th this, I, I'm sorry, I'm just talking about tactics, you know, I'm not a theoretician. Amazing loan applications, you'll love this one. We, I was uh, doing a stint in a um, very large uh, mortgage loan operation, it's probably one of the largest in the world, 180 billion a year at the time. And uh, again, nameless, not even tell you the country. But the, somebody came and tipped me off that one particular uh, department of loan origination was um, maybe not documenting things correctly. Now the thing is, when you're making a home loan, you're getting, um, you know, security over a home, but you're actually issuing a lot of money. And if people don't repay the money, you're stuck with a house that you've got to repossess and then sell. What was happening, because people were made, in, when I investigated it, because people were uh, making loans or documenting loans based on income and getting commission for it, that's what they did. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. Sorry, it's so ridiculous I have to laugh at it. I was looking at people, at some of my staff were bringing me loan files where um, bank statements to prove income, the columns didn't even match up. So it would have the top of a bank statement here where it would say the bank and the name. And then because it's a photocopy, there would be the statement with the, the item and the money and this kind of thing. But the columns didn't even match because what had been happening was that they were photocopying somebody else's financial statement and attaching it to the other person's bank statement thing. The net effect is money goes out, buys a house, people don't repay, bro the loan officers get a commission, and then the company's stuck with having to repossess a house and sell it, which can take months. So, and usually you take a big loss if you're, if you're on a, what we call a foreclosure. So that was, a, that was kind of a very good whistleblower complaint there where we, that really worked for the company. I mean, I, honestly, I, I just see the practicalities of the thing. You know, we need one day to sort of have a thing about just how to make these things work, these whistleblower things. What's the next one? Oh, I love this one. This is in the newspapers. I can talk about this as much as I like. I was only in the repair team. I didn't find this. This is another whistleblower complaint. The city and county of San Francisco had a, uh, used to have parking meters where you put coins in the slot. So, um, they're just, everybody hates them. You park, you put the coins in, finds you after 10 minutes or something. And these, these meters, there are people that go around and collect the money. 
and they've got a kind of a, just a sack in the bottom of the meter with their key and money drops out into it. Well, what was happening, which nobody knew until somebody informed on it, somebody within the, the department, was that for a number of years, actually, it had been a system of the coins are 50% for the city and 50% for the people who collect them. <laughs> and once a week, there was a truck that would uh, take these huge numbers of coins to Reno, Nevada, because we have the casinos there. I actually lived in Reno for a while. It's a very nice little town. And you don't pay any income tax because it's tax free because of all the people that lose their money at the casino, which is a good thing. <laughs> which, the, um, but yeah, it was just at that time the the uh, as what we call the outfit. This is wild. I got two minutes left, but this is a good story. They were they were laundering the coins through the casinos and just getting real money back. I'll get another case, and I can be very quick. Oh, yeah, no, this, this is my last one anyway. This one happened la last, uh, early last year. It's still in the courts. But these guys, this, th these are the CEO and the CFO of a very major company. This is what could go wrong with whistleblower. This isn't a good story. Well, it is, but it's. What happened with these guys was, and actually they, they were both friends of mine, I, but I'm, you know, so I'm not laughing at them, but. They shouldn't have done this. They, they got into a boardroom dispute. And in the US company, the board is in charge. So I'm sorry to say this. They got fired. They got fired for, uh, well, not mismanagement, but poor management and needed new people to, to take the company further. You know what they did? They immediately filed a whistleblower complaint. They said that they were fired because they had made a complaint about the board who to? I don't know. Maybe they said it to me. I don't know. But it was... <laughs> I did get caught into it and said I knew nothing about it. So that was... But that's the t top executives, because they're technically also employees. That's like your commissioner of uh, police deciding that he's being fired for saying something. Anyway, sorry, I, t I can talk forever and I'm not going to. So I'll let you... <laughs> Do you need the mic back? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Francis. Yeah, uh, is this thing on still? Yeah, thank you, Francis. The weird case that's inspiring. I hope, yeah, it's gonna work out. Um, last but not least, we have Deborah Pavila, who she's attorney and uh, she's advising clients on a wide range of national and EU law matters, specializing in primarily in competition law. So when I ask uh, Deborah, first thing that comes in mind when I say whistleblower, she answered company's internal auditor. So yeah, Deborah, your 15 minutes is here. Here you go. Don't show my secrets before I've started. Good afternoon. Um, well, I must admit, this wasn't my first reaction when I found out about the law. My first reaction uh, was to check if there are any sanctions. And there are no sanctions for failure to comply. So I thought, very good, then I don't have to read the law. And my clients will not have to implement it. As I said, not very sophisticated. But somehow the uh, law kept on uh, popping up on my schedule and I had to think about it have second, second thoughts about it. And then I um, thought about the law in the context of competition law, because competition law is uh, what, I, what I know best, uh, what I do daily, my, my practice is uh, based on competition law. So suddenly uh, things started to, uh, to fall into places, and I understood that actually, if you have strong internal whistleblowing system in place, which is what the law says that you must have if you have 50 employees or more, or are a public is, uh, institution, um, you can actually, as a company, escape very heavy competition law fines and also other fines for other breaches, and you can save your reputation. 
So then finally my answer was that um, the um, whistleblower is not a snitch. Uh, this can be the internal auditor. This is a very bad example of a whistleblowing case and you can watch the movie. Another title for this presentation uh, could be uh, have a very strong internal whistleblowing procedure and probably you will not make it to a Hollywood movie uh, about your company and about the whistleblower from your company. So The Informant starring Matt Damon uh, is a movie based on a um, real life story about a huge cartel that was discovered thanks to Mark Whitaker, the whistleblower portrayed by Matt Damon. Um, that was a lysine cartel. Uh, lysine is a feed additive and uh, it was an international cartel on market sharing and price fixing between uh, USA, uh, Japanese and Korean companies. So the top executives of those companies uh, met, divided international markets, fixed prices. They didn't know that there was a whistleblower among them, a person who already cooperated with FBI and taped the meetings. That was Mark Whitaker. So uh, finally FBI came in and uh, they, uh, they, they uh, brought justice, but there was a huge but. It turned out that Mark Whitaker had been embezzling money from the company that he blew the whistle on during the time when he was cooperating with FBI. So suddenly the case didn't look so good and he had been embezzling uh, $9 million. So um, it ended up uh, with the uh, company that he blew the whistle on paying 100 million US dollars as a fine for the competition law breach, just one of the breachers. Uh, also top executives went to prison, uh, the uh, longest prison term being 30 uh, months because in the United States for a uh, breach of competition law, you can go to prison and they did. But Mark Whitaker had to serve nine years in prison. But now he's out, and uh, I heard that he's giving lectures, so he's doing well. So if you have a strong internal whistleblowing procedure, you can escape this out outcome, and also the whistleblower can escape this outcome, and of course, if he's honest too. Um, well, obviously, um, internal whistleblowing procedure will not help if, it's the, if it is the corporate culture to break the law, if it is the corporate culture uh, to enter into anti-competitive agreements to fix prices, for example, then of course you don't need internal whistleblowing procedure. But um, I hope uh, that it's not the case here. And then the question is, is it possible that top management does not know about uh, competition law breaches going on in the company? And I've seen in my practice that, yes, this is actually possible. I've named a few examples uh, where, uh, indeed, it is possible that either the person doing that, uh, for example, uh, at a trade association meeting discussing uh, the future plans of the company's participation in tenders or prices or, or, um, uh, or future marketing plans, uh, and they are not aware, those middle managers, let's say, are not aware that they're actually committing competition law breach. That is possible, and I've seen that. Uh, it is also possible that the person is very well aware of what he or she is doing, but they are working towards a better bonus for the end of the year uh, to increase the sales of their particular unit, or they are just getting a kickback, basically stealing from the company. That is all possible. And um, another scenario uh, is in M&A deals, so mergers and acquisitions. When uh, you come into market buy a company, it is uh, very much possible that you do not know what they have been doing before you bought them. And the regular LDD may uh, usually will not show, uh, unless somebody talks during that, that there have been competition law breaches going on. So I wanted to uh, show a few examples, uh, practical examples, where Probably internal whistleblowing procedure could have helped uh, the companies escape huge fines. One example is the British Airways and Virgin Atlantic, um, where there where middle managers, not top executives, but middle managers from both the companies, sales manager and the marketing director, uh, having uh, telcos and discussing uh, uh, 
increase in fuel surcharges, which in the end resulted in a huge increase in the uh, passenger ticket prices. I don't know, I was not unfortunately involved in this case, so I don't know how Virgin found out, but they did. And they uh, used the uh, what, what I would call the corporate whistleblowing uh, procedure or the leniency procedure and informed uh, the United Kingdom's uh, competition authority. As a result, they got a 100% discount, as we call it, the competition lawyers, the discount or immunity from the fines, uh, whereas uh, British Airways had a huge fine imposed on them. So why, uh, for, for those here who are not so well uh, acquainted with competition law, in under competition law, uh, the company is always liable for the, what the employee has done wrongly. And it doesn't matter if the employee is a top manager, a CEO, a person who has uh, rights to represent the company, or it's just the secretary, doesn't matter. The fine goes to the company, and personal liability is possible also for the person. There is also a Latvian case, the Volkswagen case, and I was involved in this one, um, as in a legal advisor, of course. Um, so <laughs> Uh, so, um, and this is, this is the case where uh, Norwegian Moller Mobility Group bought uh, companies, dealers, dealing in cars, not in drugs, in uh, Latvia, and they didn't know uh, what the dealers had been doing uh, and kept on doing for, for, for some time after, after the Norwegians bought them. So uh, they were sending emails to each other informing about an upcoming tender procedure saying, um, well, I happen to know the head of the um, of the public buyer or, or, or of the public buyer's buying committee, and uh, we've been working on this tender, so I have a very good chance to win it. So please don't submit your bids. Don't uh, come with this unwanted competition. Competition council thought that this is not allowed under Latvian law. This issue is, is in dispute in the courts. But what is important is that. The Norwegians had no idea that this was going on in Latvia. Um, and then a few years passed, they fired one of, the, they, they broke the agreement with one of the dealers because there was a serious breach of the dealership agreement. And that dealer went to the competition council and informed about this email correspondence going on. And the competition council imposed the uh, biggest fine ever imposed on one economic entity in Latvia, 7.6 million euros, which is huge for the Latvian market. It, a very strong, a good, uh, lively internal whistleblowing procedure might have helped. Somebody might have uh, informed uh, the shareholders, the new shareholders, about what was going on in the company. Um, if you have seen the headlines lately, about a week ago, the Competition Council uh, came uh, up with an announcement that they have sent the statement of objections to Riga Satiksme and uh, two companies taking part uh, that had taken part in public uh, tender procedures organized by Riga Satiksme. Why I mention this? Because it is very interesting and it is also very scary. So in the old days, it was either corruption. You could, you could uh, either the public officials and the ones giving bribes could go to prison for corruption, or it was breach of competition law, cartel. Now it seems that it can be both. That uh, the company the, and the people uh, involved can be fined under both heads, competition law and anti-corruption laws. Um, therefore, if your company has been doing exceptionally well in public tenders lately, then you are strongly advised to implement a whistleblowing procedure. So indeed, internal whistleblowing procedure can keep your company out of headlines, uh, can uh, help your company escape heavy fines, can help your company uh, to keep your reputation. And also to keep the employees, if you uh, are able to clean the situation up internally, uh, you have better chances of keeping the employees, of course the, the ones that are worth keeping, uh, than um, if the employees are forced to go public or to, to uh, inform public authorities. Because even though, of course, the law provides for, um, 
for the prohibition of retaliation. Nevertheless, if the person has uh, blown the whistle on the company he or she works for, it may be impossible for the person to keep on working in that company under cer certain circumstances. Mm, the, the, the atmosphere might be such that the person just feels better to leave for himself or herself. And um, for the whistleblower, uh, there is uh, the uh, benefit to uh, keep the job because if the person goes to the authority and uh, the competition law, uh, the authority imposes the fine, it is very much possible that there is no company after that to work for because it just can go bankrupt because of the amount of the fines that can be imposed. And of course the obvious uh, of making the company a better place to work at and also um, the possibility of escaping personal liability, for example, as, um, as an accomplice. Um, my uh, advice, even though you didn't ask, but I will give it, is that um, it is advisable to uh, at least consider involving a law firm um, as an external point of contact. Three reasons why. The first one is that um, the trust reason. For the internal whistleblowing procedure to work, you actually need to have uh, the trust of the employees to use that system. So if the, they do not trust uh, the point of contact in the company, then it will not work. And uh, an external advisor could be a good idea to have that trust because that's an independent party not involved in the everyday life of the company, not having uh, personal relations with the person that uh, somebody may want to blow the whistle on, and also not being in this hierarchical employment uh, relationship. Uh, the second reason is attorney-client privilege. So all and any communication that the whistleblower um, may have, uh, or, or the company may have, regarding the uh, whistleblowing event will be protected and state institutions, if they start an investigation, cannot uh, have a look at that correspondence between the person from the company and the law firm. And the th third reason is um, you will, in case, if, if it's a very complex infringement that the, whistle blow, that the whistle is blown on, like a competition law infringement, you will most likely, in any event, need to attract uh, external legal advice uh, because it's just the beginning of the story when the whistle is blown. The question is what to do after that. And these are just a few of the issues that have to be considered when you do receive the whistleblower's report on a complex infringement such as the competition law infringement. And the first question that has to be considered immediately is are we as a company obliged to inform state institutions about this? So if it's a potential breach of criminal law, then obviously you have to inform state institutions because otherwise you can be liable for being an accomplice, not notifying. But if it's a competition law breach, then you're not obliged under law. You cannot be held liable for just not notifying. So uh, in that case, you're not obliged to inform. Of course, then you have to carry out an extensive internal audit, fact-finding, to know everything about the case, gather all the evidence, uh, to make an educated uh, decision on what to do next. Um, so the first one was about the obligation to inform, but you should also consider maybe you should inform the state institutions. For example, uh, the um, competition authority under the leniency program in order to uh, get the immunity from the fine. So you may want to use this corporate whistleblowing procedure and inform about, let's say, a cartel that you have been involved in, but then get 100% discount from the fine. Also, uh, you have to consider whether you need to issue any statement to your competitors, clients, or suppliers. For example, if your employee uh, has been participating in a trade association meeting where some sketchy issues have been discussed, um, but you have come to the decision that you will not inform the competition authority, maybe because the, uh, the discussions were not that bad but are on the, on the verge, what you have to do is to publicly distance yourself from anything that may 
in the future go on in that uh, trade association. That is what you are required to do under competition law. So you have to make a public statement to the, uh, to the not a public statement, but a statement to the other competitors uh, that you do not want to take part in any such discussions in the future. You have to make an internal announcement at some point in time, but you have to very carefully consider when to do this in order to prevent a destruction of evidence or, or any information leaks. And obviously, uh, last but not least, is self-cleaning and training e to let go of the people who you have to let go and to make sure that nothing like this happens in the future, that everybody is aware of the law as it is. So if um, you require help with anything of, the, of what I told about or with the internal whistleblowing procedure, I can help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Deborah, uh, for a nice closing. And uh, now we can uh, move forward to some questions. And maybe at the first I will ask, maybe the panelists have a question to each other, something. No? No, that's okay. Then we open the floor for you. Uh, maybe you have some questions for the panelists. Yeah. Adi, yeah. Ah. Uh, hello, my name is Louise Mantinha. I'm from Printful. Uh, we are also currently working on this internal system. And I have actually two questions. One would be for uh, Ms. Gosha. You said that you have different channels used internally for CEMEX. Uh, perhaps you could uh, mention how employees know which channel to use, for example, this uh, system or going to departments. And uh, also, perhaps you can mention the volume of cases you have received. And the uh, other question would be to Ms. Pavela. You said that um, it, it is important to have uh, trust, uh, trustworthiness of this uh, internal uh, point of contact. Perhaps you could also elaborate on that what is meant by uh, internal point of contact? Is this the system we are putting in place or do we have to um, dedicate a special person which, which would be known by the company's employees to whom you can go to? Thank you. Thank you. Evita, could you start? Yes. Um, it is uh, actually an interesting question because, uh, as I uh, already mentioned in, the, in my presentation, uh, all of these uh, channels have been used. Um, and um, people simply, I mean, they, they choose probably simply depending on, uh, on, um, on what they report about. Um, I would say that uh, when I mentioned uh, um, these reports, um, uh, regarding uh, behaviors of board members, they were actually um, submitted uh, using ethos line. So uh, I would assume that maybe, you know, people simply, I don't know, uh, think, you know, that this is uh, maybe uh, like uh, knowing, you know, that this is an outsourced, outsourced service, you know, that uh, they don't have to somehow uh, speak to somebody, you know, that uh, not to somebody close, and uh, that they, you know, they simply submit their message somewhere, you know, somewhere which, where, where they even don't know where it is actually. Uh, so it might be, you know, like uh, this th this feeling, but but this is just my assumption right now. Uh, but 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 uh, really, we have uh, all these channels exactly uh, for the reason that uh, that that people uh, may choose. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, people uh, choose the opposite, you know, they want to understand who they talk to, you know, that, uh, that this is a real person, you know, that they trust, and they approach and talk to that real person, you know, they have that security, um, which, which they have also expressed, actually, when, when submitting uh, that report. Um, uh, due to the fact that, uh, that we have that, um, 
that business culture of speaking out and open door policy and everything that I mentioned, uh, we don't have uh, that many cases submitted uh, through um, through these channels, through these uh, mechanisms. Uh, but uh, every year we have several cases, uh, and uh, the biggest number I think it was in 2016 when it was seven. So usually these are let's say four you know, and two to seven. So not that many, but as I said, you know, we have all these other mechanisms, you know, how people have uh, have the possibility to raise their concerns. So uh, uh, let's say using these whistleblowing mechanisms, this is, uh, this is already, you know, like uh, something very special, you know, that they, uh, that they probably have a feeling, you know, that, that they really have to report you know, not not that they can uh, solve their issue by simply talking to somebody, discussing the matter. You know, just raising uh, raising it up in a regular conversation and something like that. Thank you. Yeah, could you pass it to Deborah? Do you still remember the question? I do. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, yes, I, th I think uh, Evita already partially covered this. Uh, the uh, criteria for the uh, for the um, internal point of contact or external point of contact. Uh, would be um, the um, trust, is there trust of the employees in that person or unit that they have to, uh, that, they, that they should report to. So for example, if you dedicate the um, head of uh, HR as the point of contact, and she's a very nice lady, but everybody knows that she's a huge chatterbox, probably the employees will think twice if, if they want to, um, uh, talk to her about a serious breach or, or a sexual harassment case or whatever because they might fear that the next uh, the next lunch the news will be out uh, involving the name of the whistleblower uh, so that is and also uh, if it's just an inter internal point of contact um, it is also important if the employees can trust that this person or unit will be neutral um, or and that they will not be under the pressure of the management to resolve the situation in, in favor of the management. That is why I suggested um, external uh, law firm as, as an option, at least, for this point of contact. Uh, but, uh, but definitely, if, if you choose that option, uh, there should be a meeting uh, for the employees and, and uh, a designated person or persons from that law firm to build this personal relation and so that the employees can see th these people uh, in the faces, talk to them, and have the feeling that they are trustworthy. Thank you. Like yeah, like sure. Yeah. Just a practical side of it. I, I think that the um, depending on the size of the operation, it works a lot better if there are multiple um, avenues, just as you were describing it, Evita. It's, um, then people can choose. On top of that, they can then, if they don't get a satisfactory answer and they've got a genuine case, they've got another place to go to. But I think if you're a smaller operation, what I like, the reason we recommend this in, back in the US is the 1-800 number with an external contractor. I mean, whether it's an organization like yours or whether it's a legal um, firm, it depends on taste. But that's, that kind of neutral thing is, is often good. The other problem you've got if you've got a small um, operation, though, is I had one referred to me a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I started to ask the, um, somebody on the board and somebody on the CFO. Both of them said the same thing. Can you tell Nicole that's not a problem? Yeah. Nicole being the guy, <laughs> they knew who it was. Yeah. <laughs> Anon anonymity is always, I think, a problem and a challenge, even for the far yeah. biggest companies. Uh, more questions, any more? Yeah, yeah. Could you pass the mic? What do you to Yeah. To whom? Hi, um, my Hi. name is Esther. I'm from Coca-Cola Hellenic. Uh, and my question is to Evita regarding um, this ethos uh, line. Uh, how do you make sure and how do you handle cases when the, you clearly see that they are uh, made in bad faith? Hmm. Um, we, uh, again, I have to re-emphasize that, uh, that we um, uh, try to promote the culture of, uh, of um, suggesting and uh, speaking out and reporting, but in good faith, of course. Um, and uh, actually we had uh, one case which clearly was in bad faith uh, very recently, uh, which was ma made in uh, bad faith, uh, but uh, I mean, we 
investigate the facts and we um, we provide the feedback you know that uh, we found no basically no violation in, in that particular case. I mean, you know, there's nothing like uh, extremely special about it. You know, the result, uh, the outcome is as, as it is. Uh, but, uh, but, but usually, uh, usually really, I mean, the, I would say 99% of the cases are made in good faith. And as I already mentioned, uh, usually, uh, um, I mean, we have saved a lot of money actually, you know, so in some cases uh, uh, which, were, which have been reported and, 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 and uh, um, uh, uh, let's say, Employees, uh, uh, there are employees that uh, are not employees uh, anymore, and, and, and so forth. So, um, but really, I mean, we investigate uh, um, as good as we can, you know, like using all the all the legal tools we have at our disposal. And um, yeah, I mean, if 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 there is no violation, there is no violation. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ines. Um, I'm just curious about one issue that is uh, for the state authority is now an issue of debate. I wonder how it's in the private sector. So anybody can answer my question. It's about the managers. Uh, so this uh, reporting system, is it better when it's a matter of the responsible persons? Like uh, you designate somebody who will receive, register the report, somebody who will investigate it, uh, and it remains among these people. Um, uh, or uh, at some point the manager is also involved, uh, which is uh, for the public body, it will be the head of the institution, uh, which in some cases would be the minister and all the procedures for signature. So it's, uh, it's um, now a big issue. Uh, whether we construct it in a way that it's kind of internal control matter, uh, or it's uh, involving or many people. <laughs> And at some point can, of course, be a problem to report if you know that actually it all will go up one day to the director. So how it's in the private sector uh, in this uh, relation? Thank you. Do you get it? Um, approximately, I think. Um, but, uh, well, I think we, we go back to these uh, different channels. Uh, because, uh, well, we have to consider possible conflicts of interests and, and, and so forth. I mean, if there's one person designated or, or two people designated, you know, as, as, as uh, collectors or, you know, like uh, the ones regis registering the, the, the cases or investigating, then clearly we can, uh, we can face a situation then actually maybe exactly these are the people, you know, like uh, regarding whom these reports are made. So um, really, I think the, uh, the variety and, and uh, you know, the possibility for people to, to choose, you know, if, if, I, if, if I, I understood your question correctly. Okay. And uh, if I, if yeah, I may, yeah. just quickly, uh, one, one, one remark regarding uh, your, your previous question. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, people report not because of bad faith, but just because they, uh, they don't know, you know, like uh, that there is no problem, you know, that they see, for instance, uh, a conflict of interest, you know, in a, where, where actually it doesn't exist or, or, you know, something like that. So there are cases like that, too. Uh, Eva, could you pass the mic, please? Hi, uh, Gita Kloos from SEB Bank. I have a question about keeping the reg registry of all those uh, whistleblowing cases, uh, especially for Evita question. You have so many channels. How do you have uh, the final record of total uh, whistleblowing cases? Um, again, as a big corporation, we have a system <laughs> we have responsible people for for that like uh, in uh, in 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 every country um, in in our case uh, currently while there is no conflict of interest related to, to HR this uh, this uh, this information the uh, statistics as well and, and 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 all the data is kept by the HR department so they because we also of course uh, have a system of uh, of collecting uh, reporting, you know, exchanging of information, you know, like of experience and so forth. So currently it is kept by, by, by the HR department at the end of the day, I mean. Uh, but, uh, but, but let's say, uh, if we uh, go back to, uh, to the ethos line, you know, which is, which is really, you know, like uh, somewhere, I mean, not, uh, not in our business unit, then, um, then um, again, uh, there are uh, uh, specific channels how it is, how it actually, uh, this information also comes to our business unit. I mean, again, you know, like corporate system created specifically for, for that purpose. 
Okay, thank you for questions and uh, answers as well, and thank you speakers. And uh, uh, can I get a round of applause for our speakers, please? <laughs> yeah, and uh, just uh, just a few things to close up all this day. Of course, the the most important part of wine and networking is coming, so don't go away. Uh, but kind reminder to the companies that you still have a one month to install your safe whistleblowing channels because the first May is coming. And uh, kind reminder also, there hasn't been any system in Latvia like this before. So all is new. There is no wrong answers. There is no wrong systems. Just let's try, let's do, and let's develop from step by step, and as my uh, colleague or boss, Valdis Liepinch, likes to say, slowly, slowly, catchy monkey. So yeah, and slowly, slowly, we will develop a perfect whistleblowing system in Latvia, and yeah, thank you all for coming, and yeah, bye. As my old friend once said, a good conference uh, requires two things. Uh, the first is the content and uh, making sure that participants uh, leave the conference a bit wiser than they arrived. I hope that we have in those three sections provide enough food of thaw thought for you so that you can uh, digest the information you absorbed uh, on the topic. And the other thing, as my friend told me, is make sure that there is some wine following after the conference. And this is exactly what we have uh, ensured for you. And please uh, p feel free to, to proceed to the room behind us and, and continue the discussions if you wish so. Thank you very much.